Alright! Welcome to another episode of This is Revolution. Coming at you all the way live from Oakland, California. So, I was deleted once again from Facebook. This is the second time in like a week, two weeks, I've been deleted from Facebook. And this comes after uh, Pascal and I, my lovely co-host that I do the live stream with and sometimes you hear these podcasts that are the audio uh, dumps of the live streams Um, uh, Pascal and I had just been guests on Zero Books show with Doug Lane and he initially wanted to ask us some questions about Adolf Reed and then definitely the conversation took a whole other turn and we, we stayed pretty much on this uh, conversation of the ant what was it called the anti anti uh, racism of, of Adolf Reed and, and Walter Ben Michaels who Pascal and I were were not as familiar with but definitely were both familiar with with Adolf uh, Reed his son has been on the show a few times uh, we are friends we share a lot of the same politics I have nothing but the utmost respect for Torre and his father's work. Um, also, the work of other people in the same uh, ilk, uh, Cedric Johnson, um, uh, Preston Smith. Uh, the list goes on. But anyway, I don't think we said anything that was so crazy and uh, riot-inducing to to cause us to get kicked off but I had checked my social media that morning and everything was fine like 6 o'clock that morning and uh, by the time I got done dropping off my child, my 2 year old uh, I couldn't get on Facebook and I was deleted again and I was furious and Pascal calls me confused and then later furious uh, that he was deleted from Facebook and this time around so the first time I got deleted from Facebook, I lost one page that I run that's kind of like a label page for the music that I'm able to put out. And it's not, it didn't have the biggest following because it was just kind of a page for the, for the label um, that literally just puts out music that I do. It, it wasn't a big deal um, losing that page. The second time around, though, I actually lost a page from a band I was in with my ex for like seven years. Um, And we did four or five records. And there was a lot of pictures on that page that I don't have anymore. And I, you know, I was actually getting ready to back up a lot of stuff. And... I find out I'm banned again. I was like, oh, shit, I just lost the Le Fin page. The name of the band was Le Fin Absolute Du Monde. Uh, maybe I'll end the show with some music from that band. Um, or not. I don't, I don't know. Fuck it. Uh, and I was pretty pissed off because I, <sighs> that band is pretty much done, and that relationship, of course, is done. But to be to just be able to, to lose not just all those photos lose all those live videos there were like some interesting interview clips uh that people had posted there over the years that you know i have no idea where those things are or who interviewed us on top of my head um she stopped being an admin on the page uh, I, th- I, th- I don't know if she left social media altogether. I haven't spoken to her in a few years. Um, so there's just no one. The page is gone. And I was pretty upset. And again, once again, we were taken down from social media. 
And Pascal was equally upset because he had a page uh, that he had started with someone uh, that he's no longer in contact with, that he was an admin of, um, that had a pretty decent following. And erasing his profile erased him from that page. And I was, I was furious, and this happens the same day I have an interview scheduled um, with uh, Dr. Michael Harris, who wrote uh, Welcome to the Rebellion. He's got a new book coming out in April called Stay Alive, excuse me, using um, The Hunger Games as a narrative for capitalism's collapse. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this right now, man. I'm kind of pissed off. I'm trying to figure out how to get a profile so I don't lose the podcast. And luckily I wasn't able, I I didn't lose the podcast page because I have some backups there. And I'm talking to him, I'm like, and I'm furious here. I'm like, why would they cancel Pascal and, and myself and not the, the the guy that actually hosted the show we were on if that's why we're being uh, taken off and he goes well you know uh, Doug Lane is an independent book publisher and what does that say if Facebook is literally banning books and that's what they would be doing if they tried to silence him I was like, oh, I never thought of that. Hmm, interesting. And then uh, I found this article from the World Socialist website. Came out yesterday, the day of the purge, when this, this, all, this all took place. Facebook purges left-wing pages and individuals. On Friday, Facebook carried out a purge of left-wing, anti-war, and progressive pages and accounts, including leading members of the Socialist Equity Party. Facebook gave no explanation why the accounts were disabled or even public acknowledgement that the deletions had occurred. And it shows a picture of the message that uh, I got, and I guess so many others got, that just says your account's been disabled. And you can go to the Help Center... And when you go to the help center, it says, oh, file this appeal. And then it says, your account's been deleted. Um, there's, there is no appeal. At least a half dozen leading members of the Socialist Equity Party and their Facebook accounts permanently disabled. This included the public account of Genevieve Lee, the National Secretary of the International Youth and Students for Social Equality, and the personal account of Niles Nemuth, the U.S. managing editor of the World Socialist website. In 2016, Nemuth was the Socialist Equity Party's candidate for U.S. vice president. Facebook also disabled the London Bus Driver Rank and File Committee Facebook page, which was set up with the support of the Socialist Equity Party in the U.K. to organize opposition among bus drivers. This follows a widely discussed call for a walkout by bus drivers to demand elementary protections against the COVID-19 pandemic. None of the individuals whose accounts were disabled had violated Facebook's policies. Upon attempting to appeal the deletion of their account, they received an error message stating, we cannot review the decision to disable your account. With no explanation or warning, Facebook has effectively seized the intellectual property of those it has targeted, cutting them off from years of their photos, writings, and online discussions. Also targeted was the Socialist Workers' Party, in the UK, its main national Facebook account was disabled with approximately 20,000 followers, together with its student group, the Socialist Workers Student Society, with approximately 5,000 followers, as well as its annual Marxism Festival with 12,000 followers. Additionally, entire branches of the organization were disabled on Facebook, particularly in Scotland, as well as the Facebook accounts of individual members, according to the uh, uh, SWP representative uh, Lewis Nielsen. This has been a concerted attack on us, Nielsen told the World Socialist website. Following widespread protests on Twitter and other social media networks, Facebook reversed the ban of the SWP's main page, although the pages of a number of local branches and members remain offline. 
The attack on leading members of the SEP and other left-wing organizations is a calculated act of censorship at the behest of the state and the ruling class to silence opposition. These actions are part of a years-long campaign to create the framework for censorship in the United States and internationally. Such acts of censorship are a desperate response to the growth of population of popular opposition inequality social misery and the ruling class's disastrous response to the COVID-19 pandemic which has put profits above the protection of human lives the world socialist website has for years warned about the crackdown on left-wing political organizations by Facebook Twitter and Google since the 2016 election, the U.S. intelligence agencies have advocated Internet censorship in the name of fighting, quote unquote, fake news. While these actions have been presented as uh, targeting far right conspiracy theories, they have, in fact, disproportionately affected left wing anti-war and socialist organizations. In 2017, Google announced that it would promote, quote unquote, authoritative news sources over alternative viewpoints, leading to a massive drop in search traffic to left wing sites. This is true. This actually uh, happens when I watch something as light as like the majority report on YouTube that uh, I watch one episode. The next video I get is a Fox News uh, thing. So it's real. And what's frightening about things like this is it causes you to self-censor. I'm afraid to say anything right now because I don't know what words I'm using what phrases tied together are causing the algorithm to jump off. I'm not ending every Facebook post with power to the people. Literally the last thing I wrote before I got banned was uh, I was going to be on Zero Books. And before that, I asked if anybody had watched the documentary about the Night Stalker on uh, YouTube because I'm from California and the Night Stalker had came up to the Bay Area and it was quite frightening when he was here. And, you know, the, the, I thought it was a great documentary in the sense of it kind of captured an era and was very unsettling. The way they filmed it uh, reminded me of being a very scared young boy during that time and anything that hit my window I definitely <laughs> went into panic mode since I was home alone a lot as a, as a young kid um, and that was like the last thing I said on Facebook so I don't know, you know again I don't know what is triggering the algorithm is it a person mad is it right wing trolls I don't know I don't know but the page is still up. The podcast is still going. Pascal and I, as I record this on January 23rd, the year of our Lord, 2021. Um, we're excited for the upcoming episode of the live stream. And, and I've got uh, some interesting interviews lined up for the podcast. But this show in particular is a show we did with a good friend of mine, Conan Neutron. Uh, Conan plays guitar and sings in his band called uh, Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends. Uh, his drummer is uh, Dale Crover of uh, the Melvins fame. And the bass player is Tony Ash of the band Coliseum, formerly of Coliseum. So it's an all star lineup, and sometimes I get to play in the touring lineup of the band. Um, and Conan uh, was very upset about what had happened to me because, of course, he doesn't like censorship. And I'd be equally as upset if my boy got censored. He also has a very, very successful music po podcast called Protonic Reversal. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, let me write that down right now. Conan. So I don't forget. Uh, he talks to everybody from Buzz from the Melvins. Uh, I think he had some members of Tool. It's definitely a rock music podcast, but it's very, very great podcast. Because Conan is a huge fan of music and an encyclopedia of knowledge uh, when it comes to, to 90s rock music. 
So that being said, here is our conversation. Uh, Conan, Neutron, myself, and my co-host Pascal Robert of Black Agenda Report. Now I got to say Pascal Robert of This Is Revolution Podcast, right? I should start saying that. Also, I'll put a link to Pascal and I on Zero Books. That was a good show. It was a fun show with Doug Lane, and I do like our relationship with the channel so far. If you didn't know, every Wednesday, uh, an episode of our Tuesday live stream goes up on Zero Books channel. I'll put a link to the description in that. Also, uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want to be involved in these discussions. Um, this episode will drop on Wednesday, so you won't even get a chance to be in the discussion. But if you're a patron, you'll hear it Tuesday morning. So for the patrons, if you want to be part of the discussion, go uh, like the, the show on YouTube. This is Revolution Podcast or Twitter or, or preferably YouTube and chime in. Because we definitely read the questions on air. You don't have to do a super chat for us to read your question. Um, we're very involved in the chat, probably too involved with the chat. But uh, the episode coming up, uh, we're going to be talking to Fred Hampton's lawyers uh, who recently unearthed uh, some documents uh, showing that it, his, his death was a hit ordered uh, by the FBI. We're going to talk about that and a lot more. But this episode is going to be about big tech and how far big tech uh, can go or should go. And it's an important discussion because there are some far right voices, right? Donald Trump, Alex Jones. People are very scared of these voices. January 6th. Listen to some of the, the, the interviews from some of the Congress people that were targeted. Rashida Tlaib says they shit all over the halls and they shit all in people's offices and desks. It's fucked up. Somebody had to clean it up. There's images of people cleaning up like trash. And it's really hurt. Those are images of like older black people picking that shit up. That's some foul ass shit, literally and figuratively. Um, you know, listen to AOC. Shit, shit, even Mike Pence. Is this the type of speech you feel comfortable getting banned? Should any speech be banned? Should these things, these social media platforms be public? Should the internet be a public good? We discuss these questions and more. Thank you very much. such a fatuous remark you know i mean that was one of the early capitalist industries was well yeah like they said on that great uh, comedy show mr show you know people mm -hmm. selling people to people like, that's, <laughs> that's one of the first industries that there is and without all that free labor there's no cotton boom and people don't realize look like cotton big deal i don't wear cotton like cotton was the <laughs> oil of that time you know like mm -hmm. the whole industrialization of the northern part of the country where we look down on the South, you know, school capitalism here instead of that early slave plantation economy. It was that super low cost cotton, thanks to not having to pay your workforce anything, because you enslaved them and you own their children and can sell them if you want. Like that's why that feed resource was so cheap. That, that's a big part of why the country is rich to this day. You know? So yeah, that's amazing to me, but also it's kind of goofy. When I was talking to him, like you talk to these Ayn Rand libertarians, 
and they say, oh, you know, the, the government's, you know, America is not capitalist, so we can blame our problems on the parts that aren't capitalist rather than the reality, which is like a very capitalist here, you know. And just because these words become empty, you know, capitalism is where you, know, you got an economic system based on markets, you know, where supply and demand in markets decide how much we're going to make of different products, and where you have private property on a large scale. So not just like your personal pair of pants and your smartphone or your private property, but also like I can own all the land in a, you know, like you can be like Larry Ellison, who is a Washingtonian like me, who bought the island of Lanai, one of the Hawaiian islands. That's his island. He bought it. This was like in 2005 or something, you know, it's a little while back there. Uh, that's interesting. You can own all the telecommunications wires in a region that bring the internet to you. You can own the oil refineries that let us have energy. Like, that's capitalism. And so the fact that we have, like, Social Security and Medicare so that old people can get health care, even if their pension doesn't cover it, like, that's not enough to make it socialist, Mr. Brooke. I'm very sorry. So these guys have been ducking out of recognizing capitalism's problems by pegging them on the fact that government exists at all. The fact is, yes. it's existing on top of a capitalist system, and it's kind of a cheap evasion, you know? And plus, these guys talk like Reagan never happened. You know, ever since the Reagan Revolution, <laughs> you know, since it's the neoliberal period, and we've been hacking away at the EPA, hacking away at taxes on the rich, you know, cutting labor law enforcement. The unions have been pretty crushed. Those aren't small changes. They're all changes that move us closer to that pure capitalism of the Gilded Age, you know, the late 1800s that I was trying to get him to think about for a second. So to me, it just shows, like, you know, these guys, they have a lot of intellectual pretensions, and some of them have degrees, and they get a lot of Koch brother, you know, dark money, whose, you know, sources we can't really see. So they can be very prominent, but they're total intellectual opportunists as soon as you dig under the surface of it. To hear the rest of this show, All right. That was a clip that I did from an interview I had a while back with Professor Rob Larson, who wrote Capitalism vs. Freedom. Uh, that's on Zero Books, where also you can catch the show every Wednesday. Uh, and that's going to be part of the discussion today, because for those of you that know, my Facebook account was totally deleted by Facebook for violating community standards. I wasn't given a warning. There was no email. I literally just woke up and my Facebook was deleted. Being that I don't try to violate community standards and say foul shit and threaten people and all the other things that would violate community standards. Um, I didn't back up a lot of pictures. And a lot of those pictures I've had for a few years, there were pictures of pictures so that I don't have anymore. And I definitely lost a lot of Pictures of my kids <clears throat> and touring memories and things like that. But I will digress. Pascal Robert, my co-host, my brother. Yes, yes. How you? How are you living? Uh, I'm living Facebook. a little angry. <laughs> Facebook censoring and causing all kinds of consternation to our podcast endeavor. Yeah. Uh, very dis disconcerting. Not happy. <laughs> Even starting up this show was a whole to-do because it, we were disconnected from all of our, our usual streaming accounts. And also to come in and vent with us is a very good friend, and I'm sometimes his bandmate uh, with his project, uh, Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends. You also may know him from his extremely successful podcast, Protonic Reversal, which is definitely more a music show than it is a political show. But much like when we get to have Dan Larson on here that gets to talk about politics, Conan gets to come on here and talk about politics. Conan Neutron! Peace and greetings to Conan Neutron. Thanks so much. Lighting looks better now in the room. Conan. It looks less conspiratorial now. Having an audio issue here. Let me. I'm Can you hear us? Uh oh, he's he's fixing his audio. Did he go black on us? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like that was a total. Under... Yeah, he's I he's taking. Even... You jab turkeys, I'm gone. <laughs> you jab, jab. 
<laughs> so for the number one. <laughs> you two so jive turkeys. turkeys. <laughs> that was such a pun that was not personal, man. Okay, I suddenly got nothing. I got nothing on audio. I don't know what's You can't going hear on anything here. anymore? Can you hear us? Conan. Can't hear us. Uh oh. What is going on? We're gonna fix that. So Pascal, what is what is your opinion about big tech and the way they're able to censor and and let's let's get it there's a there's a conversation right now because donald trump has been removed from twitter and facebook because of what happened on the 6th at the capitol right direction pushed whatever you want to call it coup I, i don't care what you call it something very bad happened people died at the capitol people feel that donald trump was at the center of it with with what he says on the internet so he finally gets kicked off the social media platforms. And now there's news coming down of bigger threats on Inauguration Day. And uh, more people, you know, Facebook and Twitter are cracking down on a lot of what people are saying. So I wrote uh, an essay, not even about any of the capital shit. It was literally about the way we treat poor people, but I used the title of a dead Kennedy song called kill the poor. And it was enough to get not me in Facebook jail, as people say, not banned. They totally deleted my entire account gone. So what's what's your take on on big tech being able to do stuff like that, Pascal? Uh, I mean, I uh, my sentiments when it comes to uh, this type of activities to realize like what are the, the the legal precedents that they they usually use in this endeavor, and the, the argument that they usually use is that these are private corporations. When you sign up to use these private private corporations. You sign on with their "quote unquote" terms and agreements, and that because you sign on with their terms and agreements, you are simply using their product, and they get to dictate how their product is regulated. And if you violate certain terms, they can delete you, or remove you, or suspend you on the on their terms. I think that. When you have platforms that are shaping political discourse, uh, allegedly influencing direction in elections, uh, actually giving access to certain types of political speech that gives candidates or movements or whole various social phenomenon in countries advantages to advance their particular movement. I think that the idea that these are just private corporations that are adhering to their own kind of regulation and we should follow them is ridiculous. When the when the Arab Spring was happening and people were saying, oh, this wonderful revolutionary thing is happening on Facebook. This is amazing. This is wonderful. I didn't hear people talking about, well, this is a private corporation and we have the right to censor these people if we want to, if we don't like their terms of agreement or their content. At that time, Facebook was heralded as some kind of arbiter of freedom, liberty, and democracy in the world because they were platforming the young, these young revolutionaries in the in the Muslim world seeking to be liberated by their, from their uh, you know, powerful totalitarian leaders. You know, but yet now that same company that those same companies that were forced thought to be forces of you know revolutionary transformation are telling you that if you don't toe toe the line with a certain political worldview, that they will shut you down. Now, I am not one who has uh, affection for fascist or fascist speech or racist speech or hate speech. And I don't think that there should be, you know, a quote unquote protection for hate speech. But I'm also one who realizes that if you just 
try to silence right wing voices, thinking that your ideologies or your 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 opinions are pure, then you don't know the history of how that type of politics traditionally has been used to silence people with politics like myself. And usually in the past, it's more people with politics like us who challenge capitalism, imperialism, racism, and sexism who get the hammer of censorship censorship than the right wingers. So I don't know, you know, I've heard, I had someone who was a good friend of mine, she was like, I don't believe in the bourgeois notion of First Amendment rights when it's protecting fascists. And I was like, how can <laughs> we on the left look at the history of how First Amendment or freedom of speech was used by workers to advance labor rights, freedom of economic freedom, economic justice? that was outside the line of thought in this capitalist society as being completely beyond the pale. And how can we be the ones making arguments that freedom of speech is a bourgeois right that we should not be licensing its use for those we find reactionary? When we, it, it is freedom of speech that allows our ideas, which many of you will find out of the public norm to get a platform. I will, I will uh, you know, love to hear what uh, our co-host, our guest has to say. I'm sorry for taking up so much time. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. Yeah, so, uh, well, well, yeah, if I may, uh, well, first of all, you know, what's the ice tea quote? Freedom of speech, just watch what you say. <laughs> <laughs> They're very quotable ice tea. I think there's also a, a big thing that we need to look at now is are the social media platforms private corporations with terms of services, as uh, Pascal uh, was 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 talking about, are we considering them private enterprise that are above any kind of government regulation, or are they a public square? That's the question. At what point does something like a Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, uh, go beyond being a tool for whatever purposes as a, a as a for profit entity or you know even non profit I suppose would be possible and when does it actually cross over into being media now even when it comes to media it's been a long time since we had the fairness act right uh, yeah and yeah I don't necessarily think that the fairness act would be even applicable or possible to deal with now but the main question right now is you you have a lot of these platforms, especially Twitter, has been incredibly lax on moderation or just non-existent on moderation of any kind. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, conditionally, when the tide shifted and it advantaged them, uh, then suddenly they're all about moderation. Okay, well, I think if you will, you either need to make a set of rules, meaning regulation, and have people abide by it, mm -hmm. or you're going to get this 15 different answers to the same question. Uh, <laughs> type, type of thing and, and and without any consistency how how you're just gonna piss off everybody and, and i personally feel that i'm a big believer in freedom of speech like the idea that freedom of speech but freedom of speech with consequence like you're, you're not protected you have your freedom of speech protected but you don't have freedom from consequence uh, yeah. And what I mean by that is, you know, the shouting fire in a in a movie theater is the um, actually I think it was just a theater when that adage came out. Like meaning, like you know, I'm gonna go see a play. Oh, watch out, fire. Mr. Lincoln. Yeah, you know, fire, fire. <laughs> oh dear, there's a fire. I'm gonna leave. Uh, but yeah, but the idea being that public harm, right? So so if somebody, and I would apply that to my friends that like lean like anarchists and whatnot that if you're when, when you're talking about hey let's go burn the police station down which first of all that's not really a premeditated action but let's just say for the sake of this argument that is <coughs> that that's incitement to violence and that if we don't apply that same thing to people planning an armed insurrection uh and and, and, and lame coup 
right? Uh, then it's not consistent. And there is no consistency. Now, I'm not saying that like more regulation is the answer, but hey, like if, if the market's going to provide, the market better provide, right? It's not. Right now, it's providing a bunch of different solutions that seem to have shifting drunk dad logic. So that's my take on that. And, and I, I can't stand, uh, like, again, I don't want to see Nazis spouting off <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. But anytime, if some idiot wants to mouth off uh, on, on Facebook or, or Twitter or whatnot, they should be allowed to, but they're not going to be, they shouldn't be free from having other people uh, take them down and, and, and question their beliefs. And there, sh- there should be a discussion. The other thing, though, is I don't think that more discussion is the answer. I think that a lot of times, like what, what is phrased as like discussion ends up just being people kind of doing their talking points at each other. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's a problem too. And that's, but that's a larger problem. That's to do Jason. Remember last time we talked about like the frame based reality and the fact that there's been this, you know, 30, 40 year push towards people just to be, in their own realm where they're surrounded by other people that believe exactly yeah. what they believe. Yeah. And, and, and this is, this is the end result of that. It's like, you know, what's, what's that, what's that meme? Oh no, it's the consequences of my actions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Come back to haunt me. That's what we're dealing with. We're all dealing with that right now. And I'm not saying I got a solution for it right now, but I can tell you damn right. Damn sure that we are not addressing the problem. What, what, what I, what I'm afraid of happened. And, and I'll be honest with everybody that's paying attention to this right now. After it happened, I was I was shook because number one, I knew I had lost some things that I couldn't get back. Number two, I was scared that I lost the show. And number three, I was scared that this platform had become so large that it affected my life to that point. That right, because you got you got all your eggs in the one basket, right? I had all my eggs <laughs> into, into one social media basket. And if you think about this, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it probably wouldn't have been a big deal if your MySpace account went down. You'd be like, oh, that sucks. I gotta rebuild my top eight. Yeah. <laughs> but you would have right, we would have we would have gone on and done whatever it was that <laughs> oh, yeah. we, we did. Sure. We were still meeting a lot more in public. We were still handing out flyers to our shows and yeah putting up posters and all the things that you used to do uh, back in the day to get the word out. And it's just a different environment now when it comes to that kind of stuff. And when I saw that everything had got erased, I was, I was like, uh, should I say something that never crosses my mind when I decide to do a show, when I decide to write an essay, I never think first, uh, what's going to happen if I say, that this is me because a lot of people people were sending me personal messages like uh is this jason miles because it says jason miles but what is this and luckily i had this cindy and i had kept a a profile of the band yeah i was able to just change the name so i gotta change some of those photos before i get But 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 you understood. Know, <laughs> it 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 scared me because it's like our our good friend Mike Cobra, who thank you for helping me get all this back together, Mike. His wife had said the worst censorship is self censorship to me. You're you're and, on to and something that, real important there because because the idea is is that you get to the point that the system has you so trained that they don't even have to censor you. You just be like, well, I don't want to, I don't even want to deal with it. Yeah. No, Riverman, you are glad you left Facebook because this this is some silly bullshit that I feel like I have to deal I with. Mean, because, Go ahead, Pascal. In, in real terms, right, how can we argue that Facebook is just a private company that should be regulated by its terms and of services? When now something like over 53% of Americans get their initial news from Facebook, Facebook is a place where people are actually having more serious political dialogue than in spaces where they're meeting in person. I mean, the notion that this is just a website that people check in on and that Facebook doesn't have a political consequence 
doesn't bear out in terms of the actual research we have on the actual website in terms of how it works already. You know, so that being said, the debate should not be whether or not Facebook is just a Facebook, uh, just a, a website. It's just a URL. We know it's not just a URL, and we know that they don't, they don't want to be just a URL. Right, right? exactly. They, they, they've worked to become a news source. They've worked to become a, a, again, a public square. So the answer, you know, is it private corporation or is it public square? Well, look at it this way. When Facebook said, we're not going to allow political advertising for like a certain duration of time, that literally affected two elections. And it affected ultimately, you know, we could, we could, that could be a whole show in and of itself as to what the uh, <laughs> effects of that were. But wh why would that be? Because advertising on Facebook, when you have certain people that, again, well, I don't, you know, I don't watch cable news and whatever it's like yeah but you're on facebook like looking at memes from like your uh your conspiracy theorist uncle right i mean like <laughs> <laughs> like like somehow like that's better like that's like some you know it's just it's it's because just because it's not regulated doesn't mean it's better it just means it's unregulated <laughs> and and i you know it used to be in days of yore i'd be like well i don't know if regulation's the answer on that but look at what they're doing with it there's an old saying, right? That if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Hmm. Wow. I like that saying. <laughs> I, I really like that. And that's exactly what has happened with Facebook is that, you know, your content, your personality, your opinions, your thoughts, you know, all, all your likes, what you like to buy, what you buy on Amazon, the websites that you like to search for on Google are all in an algorithm that they sell to corporations for advertising. Absolutely. And I think the one of the most odious things that I meant to comment on earlier, Jason, with your situation was the fact mm -hmm. that not only did they, did they do this thing to you where, as you mentioned, you lost tour pictures, you know, you lost like, you know, your contacts, you, you lost information that like, is revocably uh change your life yeah and there's no possibility for appeal are you kidding me like first of all like okay if we're talking let's let's just let's, let's put libertarian hats on right i guess it'd be a bowler <laughs> a bowler hat <laughs> no sorry uh, not bowler a fedora my bad my bad wrong hat uh so let's put our fedoras on and and be like all right the market's gonna provide well if there was an alternative that had like a what, 60, 70% market share of like news advertising, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And they had an appeal to like, Hey man, you know, somebody, somebody narked me out to use my, my dad's term. <laughs> and uh, my account got deleted. Can I have a human review this? And if one, if like me, we says yes. And Facebook says no, that makes, makes me, we the better alternative. But that said, it's a false dichotomy because they're like uh, Microsoft or, uh, you, you know, like one of, the, one of these things that are such a monopoly on everything that it's more just kind of like an academic exercise to even like talk about that. There is no competition. Who's Facebook's competition? There isn't any. There isn't and, any. And there can't be right now because they've been very smart as, as a corporate entity. And when something's come up that's, that's challenged them, they've absorbed those features yep. into their thing. Like the Borg for the Star Trek fans out there, right? <laughs> they, they just have absorbed these other like races of people across these different planets and made them into more Borg. Uh, you know, Snap, you know, Snapchat and... Uh, um, the stories. You know, the, the, sto oh, yeah. the stories, right. Yeah. And uh, like, I forget what... I forgot what the features were they stole from Google+. Plus, But Google+, Plus looked like, oh, well... They might be able to do it, even though it's Google. And it's like, oh, nope, absorbed by the Borg. So what, what I'm driving at with all that is uh, that there, there is no competitor to Facebook. And when you talk about this idea, and, and we can talk about the efficacy of capitalism and, and all that. But for folks that believe in like market solutions and a regulated free market, it's not good to have 
one company do everything. AT&T. Even when we talk about AT&T, we think of like, okay, cell phones and, and internet and like uh, U-verse and cable and, and whatnot. They're doing all these things. What a lot of people don't know, AT&T owns the lines, the physical lines that move the internet across this entire country. They lease these lines to the other providers. The only reason they have to do that is because of some legislation that was passed years ago that basically said like, hey, you can't do that. If you own every part of the infrastructure, then you are the definition of monopoly and we'll have to break you up. So they did just enough. They did just enough to get past that, which is to say, well, we're going to let all these fools like run on our stuff. We're just going to charge them like a nominal fee. <laughs> 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 so it works out for them because they don't get broken up, but they get more money, more money, more money, more money. And, and that's, that's what they're all about at the end of the day. Right? Like if yeah. there wasn't, if there wasn't a reward, for them to do it, then they wouldn't do it. And for a new, for numerous reasons, we're in a situation right now, but where people just kind of look past that. And, and it's like, well, so, so it's been interesting to see right-wingers awakening to the fact that there are these like unaccountable private <laughs> corporations that are controlling large aspects of culture. Now, because it literally, because it affects them. That is the only reason it affects the them. And suddenly, they give they give a damn. And what's even more interesting <laughs> is watching those same right wingers call for state sponsored response. Right <laughs> now, oh, now you like government, huh? You like right. government? Well, you now? Like, oh, you okay. like government now? <laughs> because you can't, you know, watch, you know, whatever your favorite you know, social media, YouTube video. <laughs> I, 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 videos. I, I took great pleasure in a conversation like that, just responding back, ah, oh, the market will provide. <laughs> that that it, made me so happy to, to just, it, it, in a very, in a way that's it's a little small, sure, but I was, I was just like, yeah, how's it feel? <laughs> you like that? You uh, like that? <laughs> somebody says that they wonder if, uh, I don't know if Chance Campbell says, I wonder if smaller, more decentralized social network options will become more widely utilized. I'm not sure if it would be entirely better, but maybe there's something there. I think the problem is it's hard to get people off suckling the large teat of a, a thing like Facebook. Cause like Conan said, I had amassed so many contacts from touring for seven, eight, 10 years. And I don't have any of those contacts. I'm not going to remember off the top of my head the promoter from that little venue I played in Dundee, Scotland. You know, <laughs> yeah. you got that. You got that. You remember that guy saying yeah. I mean, like, that? That's to lose all that stuff is is hard, and to and to gain all that to do it with these small networks, it's it's really hard because people also too are are not so quick to get with the new thing. Like, like what you guys are saying about Facebook swallowing up all its competitors and then absorbing those features into its own. Had I not been there and seen it for my own two eyes, them talking about that in meetings where I had to sign NDSs and talking about even the, the rollout of what live streaming was going to do. And it had nothing to do with you being more you live. It was about selling products. Using live streaming to sell products was well. Well, that's that, so. That's just it. Like, like the idea that uh, that the right wingers have is that oh, suddenly they want to cramp cramp down on uh, on our speech. They don't like our our worldview. They don't give a damn about your worldview. They're looking to sell ads and they're looking to mine data and they mine that data. It doesn't matter to them. It's widgets. It's just yep. widgets. It's all it is. And, and the idea that that. That all these these folks that are coming up are kind of are kind of entering the like mindset I was at like two thousand three. <laughs> was like, welcome to the party, pal. Like, where <laughs> where I'm sorry, where have you been? That like you didn't notice any of this stuff was happening. Uh, and, and so so there's a couple things to you address that I kind of want to get to real quick, and I, I want to answer that <clears throat> listener question. One of which is that I think the idea of like there being these smaller entities that could fill the gaps or become alternatives uh there's a there's a break point where enough people have to join it to have that be worthwhile there have to be yeah. enough people that <laughs> do, do like a like a, a facebook brexit 
you know, I, 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 was, I was trying to think of a, uh, like a, some clever term for it, but I got nothing, man. Uh, that they all move en masse to something else. And, and the, the fact matters because Facebook has, has made it such an integral part of everyone's life. My dad, like, I mean, he's on Facebook 24 7, 365. You know, mm-hmm. and he's just like, you know, sharing memes, you know, like t- commenting on my like, frog memes. Yeah. No, 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 no. He's, <laughs> he's an old, he's, I, I, yeah, he's, and he's an old school labor guy. So it's, it's like every once in a while, one of his, his, uh, old union buddies that took a hard right turn will like mouth off and, and whatever. But he's, I mean, it's more like inappropriate. I mean, he'll, he'll, he follows like all my, uh, female musician friends who are hot and like, you know, interacts with that and i'm like man dad come on <laughs> like i get it but it's like oh, you... Whoa. like he's, he's not inappropriate or anything but it's just like man like why, why are you so busy on the internet dude <laughs> well son you got this hot friend <laughs> <laughs> but then it's also like uh you know there's, there's people that are in other bands they're like hey your dad's awesome it's like yeah he's, he's busy on the internet i like right. your dad no my, my, my dad's cool as hell and and, and everyone and every once in a while just because he's surrounded by a bunch of like Fox News watching idiots, like he'll come idea come in with some sort of like take on something that I'm like, yeah, man, that kind of sucks. Here's why I think why. And he'll always be like, you know, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. And but that's my dad. My dad's got critical thinking skills, right? He's a very smart, s- smart fella. Like a lot of his, a lot of his buddies that he inter- interacts with, it's a bunch of knuckleheads. I mean, I'm, I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be dismissive, but they're. Shout out heads, to man. Michael Markowski, uh, Conan and I's mutual friend that now stays in uh, in uh, the islands. Shout out to Michael Markowski. Yeah, my, my, Michael's seen this. My dad's real busy. <laughs> he loves <laughs> he loves memes too, man. That fool loves memes. He's he's all about the memes. So the more the better. My, uh, luckily, my father is not a social media guy. I'm I'm very happy for that. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say, good for you. That's awesome. Uh, so, what, what I was driving at with all that, though, is is that there needs to be a break point for there to be an alternative. Like, there has to be enough people to move over to it for it to happen. And I think that there's just so many things that are with Facebook. And, and let's not forget that inertia is a big part of this. Like, Facebook's stated goal was to be like the landing page of the internet, and people don't even think yes. about that term anymore because it used to be a term that like. Yahoo wants to be like the Yahoo portal. Y'all remember that? Like, we want to be like the land, the first place you go to on the internet. I'm like, well, didn't really work out for you, did it, son? But Facebook is where people go to first before a lot of things. And I'm not saying like, you know, I'm, it, then there's always the people that are the quick to chime in. Well, I don't watch television. You know, I don't go to Facebook first. Okay, we get it. We get it. You're better than everyone. Can you pipe down, please? But <laughs> it's the it's the landing page of the internet. So so it's how so like certain things can can emulate certain features and provide that value and that messaging. But none of them are going to be able to do all the things that Facebook does, largely because of inertia, largely because of their business model, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea that that has been baked into the concept from the beginning, and they're very good at it. What did you think about the capacity for Parler? to challenge Facebook at one point. I think the problem that Parler had was that it was it was unidimensional ideologically mm-hmm. and that it was it was it was kind of what I call the resent site in the <laughs> outer site yeah. that was birthed in resentment to the way in which it felt Trump's supporters were treated. And because of that I only felt that it would only have a certain fixed marketability in terms of uh, internet platforms overall, but it did grow. It did have a growth spurt. It did, and and I think that's a great point, Pascal. I think that like we, are, I think you're going to have limited efficacy for anything that is a reaction to something. And, and the reason why is because okay, people are hot. Oh, we're being censored on uh, on Twitter. We're being censored on Facebook. We need a place where we can, you know. <laughs> talk about our QAnon conspiracies in peace. All right, well, then, like, you can do that over here. The thing that I love about Parler, man, this, this is this is so amazing to me. You had to give, like, all kinds of personal information to them. You had to give, like, all this personal information that, you know, uh, I think you had, like, upload an ID or something along those lines. It was like, I was like, wait a minute, man. Like, aren't, 
aren't you concerned about like you know your information being in the hands of others? Like I thought that was like your raison d'etre for this like armed insurrection. But okay, when it's yeah, but they're letting us rant about uh, <laughs> a comet ping pong over here. You know, like okay, well, if that's more important to you, but but it's all but people get so worked up. And there's actually I think it was. Uh, I think it was Glenn Greenwald, who actually has a pretty good point. And, and I, I find him interesting and annoying sometimes in the same paragraph. But he brought up a really good point that like, when you take away people's ability to vent, mm-hmm. that's dangerous. And, and I say that, like, think all the way back to, like, 2000. I didn't vote for Al Gore. I voted for Ralph Nader. And, and like, in the state of California, I didn't feel, like, the slightest bit bad about mm-hmm. it. Any vote shame or whatever, everyone can go take a flying uh, fork and a rolling donut, right? But the thing is, people were pissed. I was pissed. And I remember how unfair everything felt, largely because it was unfair. But other elections have felt that same way. And I never forget that feeling. So these, these folks, the Trump people, the MAGA people, the QAnon people, they all feel that. But with their leader, their you know their cult head however you want you want to put it the uh cult 45 <laughs> cult 45. <laughs> cult 45. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> What's, what was the good. billy d slogan on that one i'm trying to remember uh ah, whatever. yeah, I'm not, yeah I'm not quick enough. pretend i made a cool reference uh these guys have their figurehead not only not say like okay john care like al gore john Kerry. they but like hey hey guys you know, we need to come together. We need to support the president so the country can blah, 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 blah. Immediately. Like, almost too soon for both those guys. Trumpy <laughs> has done exactly the opposite. He's been, he's been, like, feeling the fire. Which already, like, there's always, like, high tensions. Because we don't get past elections anymore. Because the circuits that we've created for ourselves allow us to be surrounded by people that believe the exact same thing we do. So because of that, none of us will get past elections. Remember back when Mitt Romney ran against Obama, that was the first instance that there were people that not only were shocked that Obama won, they were shocked that Obama could have won. And that's because they were so surrounded by people that just like saying the same things as they were, they believe the same things they were, like they didn't even understand that there was like that there's something that could happen. Now, take that times it by 2,000. And that's 2016. We have all like, you know, the people with the, the pink pussy hat wearers like that are that were like, oh, how could he have one? I'm like, I'm sorry. Do you live in the same country I do? Like. <laughs> I, I tell people that all the time, Conan, you know, 2012. And I know you've heard me say this and I'll, and I'll keep saying it over again was the first year I was scared to tour. Cindy and I really felt. Yeah. That hatred from that first Obama term in the center of the country. I, I think you're onto something really important here because when you're a, when you're in a band that tours, something that's kind of like a, a side effect of touring is you get to, to you see all these different areas of the country. You just don't see like your oh here the, the big city I live in how people react yeah. to stuff here. You see like how's that play in Wyoming? How's that playing <laughs> in Iowa? Right? Yeah. And it's scary, man. It's yeah. scary for me. I'm like a white dude with blue eyes. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but you know damn well that like I I, I, I tour with folks that are, are people of color, such as yourselves, uh, women. Like, and, mm-hmm. and, it, and it's and it's always it's something I never used to think about. That I was like, hey, you know what? Let me be driving on this stretch. It's 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 funny how much when you get in a band with people that haven't been in bands with people of color or or women or or. Black people, black people, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's let's just be real, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. the cop was, damn. <laughs> we would get pulled over so much, but that's a different that's a different conversation. Well, yeah, of course, right? Because uh, what are these two up to? I, mean, I have done a whole two. It's a different show. Hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's a different. That's a different show. I didn't mean to take a uh, track on. But that, but. but. I don't think people understand the power, like fully understand the power. And there's a there's a there's a comrade that sent me a uh, uh, an article when he saw me doing this show just now. And it's about it happened earlier late last year in October in Seattle, 
where a man was battling Apple to get the password to his debt murdered murdered wife's iCloud account mm. so he could pull some pictures out of it yeah. out of her phone and they wouldn't let him pull pictures out of his dead wife's phone because because they because they've taken on the identity of being data security absolutists and and and, and their mindset behind that is like I yeah think you can go further of identity absolutists in other words they sure. believe that they are the arbiter mm. of the authenticity authenticity of mm. human identity. In other mm. words, they get to see who's a real person or not. Mm. Uh, you know, and uh, I think that they, whether or not they're there yet, I think they want to be there. See, that that's a really good point. And I think it also stems from the fact that Apple specifically, Steve Jobs, his the thing that, I, like, none of these... Uh, you know, uh, biopics, documentaries, movies, whatever, ever get on this part of it. Apple's whole thing is you're doing it this way. You need to do it this way now. Like yeah. literally telling people like, okay, you're used to doing it like this. Now it's like this now. Use that. And, and that has been adopted by so many other companies and organizations that people kind of just take it for granted. Oh, we're doing this now. Okay. Whereas before it used to be like, F you. I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to do it this other way. And so the, their, their, their thing uh, as and it's so amazing to me that one of the first like big Apple ads was like a 1984 thing. The 1984, yeah. Right? <laughs> because it's like, okay, you're basically doing the Big Brother thing, but you're a private corporation. But the idea of like, do it our way. This way's better. We're not even going to tell you why. We're just going to do it this way. This is better. So, so tie that with the idea that the other thing they're trying to do is well, yeah, but we don't you know, we don't snitch. <laughs> we, <laughs> basically, is what it is, right? Like, we don't want to give it information when the government asks for it. Like, you know, we don't we don't believe in doing that. So, merge of those two things together, and, and they think they're going through some like almost like Bushido code. Like, it's like you know, <laughs> like they're like Ronins or something along those lines. But it's nothing like that. What it really is is you have, uh, you know, corp corporate demagoguery that comes in a in a friendly, trusted brand. And when you have people who have control of your data and how they control that and how they use it are completely up to them without any form of regulation, you're back to the original thing, which one of the first things that, that, that I mentioned, which is, is it private corporation or public square? <laughs> and if it's both, do you continue to just let the market decide? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how's that going? Well, I'd like to I'd like to really jump in here and talk about the market, you know, because we have these folk who will say things like, "I love my iPhone." It's this is the benefits of the technologies of oh. capitalism that allows me to have this iPhone. This is wonderful. Shout out to Business Insider for this article. This chart shows how the U.S. military is responsible for almost all the technology in your iPhone. The GPS, the fucking internet, DARPAnet was the original name of the internet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. People don't understand. Even Wi-Fi is, was publicly funded. So yeah. everything was, I think, I believe it's every bit of important technology on here from the touch screen. The military was trying to sell the touch screen. Rob Larson does some really great work in this. And I advise everybody to read. Rob Larson has two books out now, Capitalism Versus Freedom on Zero Books and Bit Tyrants. It's all about big tech, and that's on Haymarket. That's his latest book. Um, they were trying to sell this technology to IBM, and IBM wouldn't buy it, touchscreen technology. International business machines. Remember, I can't remember last time I was on, Jason. I can't remember if I threw down the, one of my favorite factoids about IBM, which is how they made their bones. Did, did you remember this? Did, that, was I talking about this on the show? I don't remember. It's been a minute. You haven't been on the show in like a year. They made machines mm -hmm. to catalog for the Nazis who were going to the camps. That's how wow. IBM made their fortune. <laughs> Look it up. Ooh. 
Yeah, yeah. Where's that uh, commercial, right? <laughs> where's that commercial? Also, we got <laughs> also uh, Fanta. Fanta mm-hmm. was made because uh, the Germans didn't like cola, so they made Fanta orange drink Fanta for the Germans. See, it's not ours, Pascal. You thought it was ours. <laughs> I love these little factoids, man. I mean, you know, yeah. yeah that's cool. that, dude. That's <laughs> that wild, wild, right? <laughs> people make these insipid commentaries about, it, like, oh, capitalism. Well, I was like, yeah, listen, this is a blood sucking economic model that benefits from other economic, other political models, i.e., in imperialism, that is premised on blood sucking as well. So, it's the market providing. The market providing. The market providing. Exactly. <laughs> so what happens? So this is my fear. My fear is that because it is so powerful, because we do get to a point of self-censoring, and once you get the far right crazies out, right? The Alex Joneses or the that's uh, a false flag. Once you get false flag guy out of there, uh, and then you get the you suppress the left voice, which is what we've been seeing happen across the board with the internet, right? Uh, Doug Lane was talking uh, last night on his live stream with Matt Bender about how the World Socialist uh, website had found that over a certain period of years that they uh, got got suppressed in searches. I mean, search the word. I challenge anyone right now to search the word socialism. Just search socialism on Google and see what comes up. And you will have to go through so many negative reactionary sites to get to any sort of like World Socialist site or even the Green Party. Well, I want to ask you guys an opinion, all right? And uh, I actually, I, you know, I know people who are in this range, and some people think that these people, oh, they should be serious. What about COVID skeptics? skeptics? You, yeah. Do we think that COVID skeptics should be suppressed, banned, shut down by all means, have their content rejected at all? Because there are many people who are fundamentally believe that you know, for some, there are some who are you know, COVID is a hoax. Period. I I'm not one of those people, but there are others who believe that COVID nineteen creates an opportunity for the lords of capital to structure our society in a way that is that expedites the pandemic crowd. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that, that's the, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and, the uh, environmental fascist people. Um, I'm more kind of like the great reset, the great reset people, the so on and so forth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I will say why I'm sympathetic to those folks because I believe that capitalism will take any opportunity, even a pandemic, to reorchestrate society in a way that benefits the lords of capital to the disadvantage of the many. And I don't need to be a conspiracy theory to believe that. All I have to do is look at history. Facts. Look, look at uh, uh, that dickhead Rahm Emanuel, right? You never let a serious crisis go to waste. You know? <laughs> I mean, there's there's definitely facts behind it, but I, I have to ask the bigger question is if I suppress the... Actually, that might have been Churchill now that I think about it, but like a, a Rahm Emanuel... I, might might have, I think he reset it, it though. Yeah. Uh, even if you, even if you uh, suppress these people on social media, it definitely doesn't stop them from making movies. Right? Go on but, Amazon yeah, to try yeah. to watch a documentary that isn't a far right propaganda piece. Well, the, you know, I, I I wouldn't necessarily say that all the COVID skeptics are right far right propagandists either. They are, they range. They are range. Cra- yeah, people- yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that completely. That that, that I think that there's people like from all kinds of political stripes that that, that have their own reasons <laughs> for for yeah. doing that. And I think that that's that's important because it's 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 easy for us to point to all these things we don't like and think that they're and, all intertwined and actually right. And I will say this, right? The consistent inconsistencies by the government's own media establishment on issues like how how successful vaccines are going to be, or how many people will be quote unquote herd immunity, or how penetrable is the vac- is the virus and I've I've seen before my own eyes people like Fauci and others and I'm not, I'm not trying to call myself one of the COVID skeptics I don't care what you think I am or not 
I've seen them drop the ball and say things that contradict it. Stop yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. They slip. They, they, they slipped in such a way that, like, whatever. Maybe they have the best of intentions, but it, it's you listen to it like what? But let me let me say this. <laughs> from I've, I've had I've had my girl who actually works in in medical research on a couple times talking about that, and I don't think a lot of people understand. There's people that just when they come up with this stuff, I think people when they think of big pharmaceutical companies because they have these big offices that a lot of that is just research and it's not it's not at all yeah so they're going hey what didn't go to market let's run it up a flagpole and see if it works on <laughs> and, and it's like, it's like a conversation i got some bad news for you call me i am not i am not an anti-vaxxer all my children have vaccines but when my girl who is not political at all the only time she ever steps in is when this conversation comes up because she works in that field and she understands how it operates i get the privilege of hearing her zoom calls all the time and her frustrations and the frustrations come from people getting frustrated at research because hmm. it gets in the way of profits it takes years for shit to come to market. Years. So, if I may, uh, on that on that point, uh, are you guys familiar? This is this is going to sound like it's a wild digression, but you have to trust me; it's going somewhere. <laughs> are you familiar with how fast food companies will do will test market certain things? Like, there's like, hey, we got this this bacon cheeseburger, and we're doing it on a pretzel bun. Yeah. And, and there's certain cities that they always like test things out. Columbus, Ohio was one of them. Mm -hmm. My, like Miami is another one. They they test out so this different out. this this different kind of food. <laughs> 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 but they test out these different kinds of food to like see like hey what happens when uh, we we put this out there? Do people like it? You know, do, does it? You know, what kind of people like it? Et cetera, et cetera. That same thing also happens with some of these ideas. And one of the reasons why is because we, we've allowed the situation where we're commodifying not just ideas, but the idea of ideas. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself can be a brand builder. Look at Alex Jones. Frogs are gay. They're putting the thing in the water for the frogs are gay. You know, like, frogs are gay. gay. You know, all right. Like, yeah. And that dude's like, you know, I talked earlier when we were setting up about looking like, you know, I was like the dude doing like the, the, the rant into his phone in a truck, right? Well, Who's that if not like the grandchild of Alex Jones, who's like the antecedent of all that with better production values, basically. And I think that we are in this a weird situation where the commodification of being the trusted source that like, well, no one else is going to tell you this stuff. Yeah, because it's crazy because it's because it's nuts. But that said, that said. It doesn't mean that like, we'll put all your blind felt into the government because they have their own agenda. Again, whether Churchill said it, which he did, and Rahm Emanuel said it never let the crisis go to waste. And the pandemic crowd, I can't, I mean, that, that, that stuff is crazy bonkers nuts to me. But, 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 I get, but I get it, right? Like, I get it because if you look at how our power structures are set, regardless of, of ethos, there is no populist representation, meaning any representation by the people, or very little, I should say. Uh, representation that represents the needs of the people. But there's a lot of people capitalizing on that, as they always have, to present themselves as the sole arbiter of, like, I alone can fix it. No names mentioned. But because of that, there's been enough test marketing, you know, putting the, the, the cheeseburger with the pretzel bun in certain markets and seeing how it plays over the years that certain parties uh, you know, walked into the suit that wasn't originally tailored for them. But they were smart enough to know that it was there. That This idea that it started off with creating these small circles of, you know, Rush Limbaugh. I'm the only one giving it to you straight. Yeah. And, and, he, and here's why I'm going to turn it around. I, dope. I got the inside dope. Yeah. 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 I, I'm the only one's going to tell you how it is. And then that, that leads to, uh, um, oh, what's that one fool? Um, I can't remember. Uh, Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck, Alex Jones, all, all that stuff. But here's the deal. That's a great analysis. It's fascinating that you bring that up how the birth of that kind of 
conspiracy, right wing conspiracy kind of positionality, right? It starts under a liberal liberal, liberal administration, yep. a liberal administration administration that I don't like. I don't think that all those of us on the left are fans of Clinton at all because we see him as the liberal birth of neoliberalism, right? He's mm-hmm. like, you know, he kind of takes the flank, he takes the, the flag of neoliberal capitalism and he takes it deep into our territory in a way that the Republicans didn't. That being said, the kind of more uh, tinfoil hat Republican nuttery, <laughs> uh, you know, come on, you know, Bill, he's got there's bodies, their bodies, you know, all that stuff starts with Bill Clinton. Mm-hmm. And I've always kind of positioned because I'm old enough to remember the Clinton, I'm old enough to remember going back to Nixon, but not, not to date myself. One of the reasons why I always believed why the right wing chattering class came after Clinton is because, frankly, Clinton's presidency was not supposed to be. And what I mean Clinton's presidency was not supposed to be is that you have to understand something. When Reagan won every state in the Union except Minnesota, which was Walter Mondale's home state, and then George Bush, the father, won in 88, The logical assumption in this country was that liberals and Democrats were done. 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 So when Clinton, right? Clinton, all of the paranoia that the conservatives have about the 60s new left, they project it on Clinton hippie, uh, lefty, smoking weed. Remember the I, I did not inhale? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I uh, do, of course. Uh, counterculture. Because my Clinton, parents were really busy inhaling. They, they inhaled plenty. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, now Clinton really didn't even ideologically respect, uh, re- represent any of that stuff per se. But it was projected heavily. He was the first baby boomer president. Mm-hmm. A lot Playing of people that saxophone. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So I think that that's 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 a super interesting point, uh, and also the DLC, the rise of the DLC, like the, ri- the rise of w- w- we're the we're a different kind of Democrat. We like corporations. We uh, you know, you know, and, and like you know, what what so what we love the, corporations the, and we hate black people. We're good for America. Welfare reform, the biggest yeah. like thing that's that like Clinton got accomplished. <laughs> yeah, like I mean. We'll put them in jail, kick them off welfare. You got to love us. <laughs> We're the Democrats. And, and that was the beginning of that. And that and, and it was kind of a, a through line through what Reagan and, and Bush had been doing before. It was just like, oh, yeah, but he plays a saxophone. Yeah, right. Well, who cares about that? You know? and, and I think that that's, that's a fascinating place to revisit because look at the leadership in the House. Three 80-year-old people, Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, James Clyburn, 80-year-old people that come from that time where they got whooped so bad, they're like, look, we got to trick people. We got to trick people into voting for us because, like, apparently, like, so they're so haunted by that. It's it's like, uh, you know, they lost their nerve long ago, and it, and, it, and it became so ingrained in their political philosophy to, like, oh, no, we always have to phrase things in, in a certain way. We have to convince people to like us, where it's like, no, your policies are actually popular, you just don't have the courage of your convictions, because all of them are haunted by you know, 84, Mondale, man, a lot of them are haunted by uh, going all, going all the way back to, to Nixon, like they, they, McGovern. How well, often do you hear also, McGovern also, used as just like, well, you can't have Bernie Sanders because McGovern. What? Like, it's I not hope, even I the same RV, situation. I hope, I hope RVJK is watching this, uh, because he actually has some really good insight on the Democratic Party starting to shift uh, neoliberal. Uh, another very good book I, I advise everybody, uh, if you can get it, is Yesterday's Man uh, by Bronco Marcus Sischeck. I'm sorry I'm saying your name wrong. But it's a, it's a really good book talking about kind of Biden's 
uh, trajectory politically and also it, it's talking about the rightward shift of the Democratic Party during those years. Because well, he, was key, he was key to that, yeah. It, it was a bipartisan consensus and it starts before Carter. Yeah. It goes back to start it goes back to Carter and it's bipartisan. You you guys familiar with the Rave Act that Biden uh, pushed forward in the early two thousands? You aware of this? Was it about raves? It was indeed. So the idea being that Yes. He, he I was, it was not Jerry Brown. No, no, this is all Biden. Uh, I mean, okay. I think Jerry Brown might have signed on to it, but he was doing this big push for it. But ultimately, like, he didn't like raves. Didn't like them. Yeah. Thought they weren't safe. So he put together this like incredibly odious legislation that wouldn't just have affected raves. It would have affected like warehouse shows and like house shows and this and that with all these bizarre punitive, like, uh, like huge uh, governmental government in your private business uh, overreaches just mm -hmm. based on safety, which is interesting. Cause that, when did that come around the Patriot act where we're like, Hey, we need to trade away some of our freedom so we can uh, be safe. And, and that was a clear, and why am I talking about all this? Because that was a clear defining moment for our culture. That when we made that decision, or rather our elected representatives made it for us, once a gene is out of the bottle, you can't put it back. And, and, and with the manifestation of that, and here's where Orwell was wrong, is it wasn't government that took advantage of that big time. Now, now to some degree, yes because there, there has been a lot of, of uh, data mining for uh, profiling in the name of terrorism. Well, we just gonna, if we, if we call you a terrorist, then we got all these other tools now that we can do to you know, put you in Gitmo and uh, get what we need out of you, et cetera, et cetera. And that is terrifying, but that's like a sea level threat compared to like what the rest of the Patriot Act has done. Because what it allowed yeah. is for the rise of these, bring it all back home, these tech companies that mine every piece of your data and that's just standard operating procedure. Uh, Shazana Zuboff, I'm probably saying her, I'm really fucking up everybody's name. <laughs> she wrote the, the book Surveillance Capitalism. And if you don't want to read the book, you can get it on Blinkist for 15 minutes. Get, get, the, get the good points of it. Uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, her on that Netflix documentary about, uh, about big data. And there's some really good interviews of her um, discussing the issues with with big data and data mining and how it's it's becoming predictive. The AI is getting so intelligent that it's, it is becoming predictive. Uh, like she tells a story in her book where a woman uh, goes to buy uh, shampoo mm -hmm. and she is given on, you know, on the on the back of your receipts, it's like things you might want. And she was given stuff for baby food. And she's like, I'm, why would I want baby food? I'm not even pregnant. I've never even had a kid. And she ended up being three months pregnant. And the AI Ooh. noticed that she was buying different scented shampoo. That's some Black Mirror stuff right there. <laughs> Predicting <laughs> you, your pregnancy. Uh, What's gonna be? What is that? Somebody said, "Don't forget, Miss Hyphenated Surname wasn't gonna be baking cookies either." Rodham <laughs> Clinton. Oh. <laughs> oh wow! Pulling the classics. You know I what? totally forgot about her. <laughs> you, you, you know what? I I, I got to say, like back back then, I was like, "Oh yeah, she's pretty cool." Like before she was actually an elected office herself, I actually thought she was pretty cool. And then I was like, "Oh, she's awful." <laughs> <laughs> but the only the only she was less thing, contentable. She was less contentable. The only thing that I really like about Hillary Clinton is the one thing she never played up, which is the fact that she is a ruthless regulator. Like she's like not regulation of capital, or like I, I mean, like she's a gangster. Like she's like the thing, like this whole Clinton crime family stuff that like the right wing likes to go off on. Nonsense. But that said, that's that crowd. Bill and Hillary especially do some do Godfather style stuff. I think that's cool because I think you need to be ruthless. I think that like this idea of like the West Wing of like uh, of, yeah, you know, like, nothing about the Clintons you're gonna get me to think is cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, I'm, I, I, like I say, I want to be clear, not a fan in any way, shape, or form. But the idea that like no, we're not treating this like it's patty cake. This ain't the West Wing. Like I, that attitude. I wish that. I wish that some people that shared my values and interests in, in, in policy 
could could apply some of those same principles and be more ruthless. And again, and again, like I'm not, I don't want, you know, let's not talk about like Vince Foster and that nonsense, like whatever. But yeah. I'm saying that's the, that is about the only damn thing that I've ever liked about Hillary Clinton. That other, other than the fact that it's like you know some, oh yeah, she's not baking cookies. Over. All right, that seemed, that was a big deal back then. It's crazy to think about, right? Like, oh, well, she's not a traditional housewife. And the burp, 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 burp. That was a big deal then, and 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 unfortunately, she's been coasting off of that <laughs> for the last like you know thirty time. some odd years. Yeah, yeah, right. And 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 you got all these people with the pink pussy hats that, that are like, you know. Like signing up for like the 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 art the the pink pussy hat army for Clinton, where it's like it's like they imbue all of these other feminist ideals and progressive ideals onto this person that doesn't give a damn about any of that. It's just it's just a, it's a method for power, and so oh, she cares about that as long as it really can facilitate her corporate centrality. Yeah, in policy, it, it, in it's. Words, it's as long as road. she can say, well, <laughs> well, you know, regulating the banks isn't going to stop racism. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the complete divorcing of uh, of class from from anything. Like making like race an identitarian right. thing rather than being anything tied into class. That's the and, extent and... to which she'll, she'll use, quote unquote, talking points to yeah. facilitate her neoliberal. No. But let's be honest, it works so well because when she gets platforms to speak on, like Ellen, Howard yeah. Stern, Howard Stern, say what you want about Howard Stern. That's a huge fucking platform. Oh, when sure. You can walk on that platform and say whatever the fuck you want to say. And, and people listen. People listen. People fuck. And, and you're not being challenged by the interviewer. No. So th- that's that's not not in certain ways. Yeah. Uh, is and, Rachel Maddow going to really challenge uh, Hillary Clinton on MSNBC? I, I, I'm I'm glad you invoked the uh, patron saint of RussiaGate because I would like to bring it back to an earlier point, which <laughs> like we were talking about like the Glenn Becks of the world, the Alex Jones of the world, the chosen facts crowd, and how there was a circuit that was built up over multi decades that allowed to the QAnon folks for them to be able to come up and react in such a way that they have their own ecosystem. They have their own, not just chosen facts, there's not agreed upon set of facts, but they have their own everything. And part, a lot of it's tied into being a victim. A lot of it's tied mm-hmm. into the fact that mm-hmm. something's being done to us, but which is sort of like, okay, like, really? Like, we're, we're, we're doing that, huh? But I wanted to turn the fire back around uh, towards liberals and the fact that within the last four years, the uh, the idea of, of of the boogeyman Vladimir Putin being <laughs> being commodified in such a way that like everyone is like is is like making their bones on like you know this is Russia that's Russia 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 like Marsha 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 Russia 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 and that's so odious and, and what I find so interesting is the same people that like you know oh wow. Queuing on crazy, blah blah blah. This and that. Like, I'm sorry, weren't you the one saying like, oh, Adam Schiff's gonna have like Donald Trump impeached within the end of the year? How the hell did that work out? Because you limited it to nonsense. Chosen the, facts. The nonsense. liberal, the liberal class, and and the liberal media, I think, helped QAnon be legitimized. Of course, absolutely. Because 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 if you have someone that. Are, are not only pretending but outright stating that they're like you know no we're a, we're a news source we're we're not doing advocacy we're not doing the Fox News thing yes you are you absolutely are but by the same token gonna turn it back around to other parts of the uh, you know the quote unquote left look at Jimmy Dore look at that look at that um, half talent ranter yeah you know what I mean like this guy. <laughs> He's uh, he's pulling the same thing of like I'm the only one you can trust. I'm the only one telling you the facts. So this jackass is coming after like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and mm-hmm. whatever, and, and is coming at being like, oh well, they don't you know they don't care about us. Blah blah blah. This and that. To say that's disingenuous and heartless is an overstatement, but it's part of the plan, and, and it, it, it's taking the MSNBC model that has been developed that they've been very profitable for them. Like the Russiagate thing, and just putting it down like indie band size, right? Like <laughs> MSNBC is Metallica in this situation. 
yeah. then like you know like whatever like he's Jimmy Doris trying to be like the Dillinger escape plan of uh, <laughs> at, the same, at the same time for me personally I don't have affection for politicians whether they're liberals or democrats liberals or conservatives yeah and uh, you know you can say what you say about Jimmy Dore I don't dislike Jimmy Dore I think yeah I understand he's obnoxious or whatnot. At the same well, time, <laughs> so you know, at the same time, my whole position is that we shouldn't romanticize any of these politicians, especially Bernie Sanders or anyone else, as being somehow the chosen savior. You know, they're not saving us, right? I agree. At all. And, I agree. With uh, that. I think that the best we can expect is that they will listen when we push back against them. The the you problem. Know? This is my problem with with that is when Jimmy Dore takes a Chris Hedges talking point, which he does a lot. It is a new metal version of it, yeah. Oh, d- God, that's a good analogy. That's a great music <laughs> analogy. That's a great new music metal version. Of it. New metal version, mumble rap version. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> remember that movie, Brown Sugar? Uh, yeah, uh, okay, remember that scene where he's in there with the with the uh, hip hop Dalmatians? Because what you going to do? Have a group called the Hip Hop Dalmatians, white dude, and say the hoe is mine? And he walks in the room, and the next day doing the song, the hoe is mine. <laughs> that's that's what Jimmy Dore does that's, in that's my Jimmy opinion. Dore. Yeah, I know. The, and, I think yeah. <laughs> and and so and so when he has people like Hedges on the show, because Jimmy Dore is a huge platform, yeah. and Hedges is going to talk to a guy that wants to talk to him. Let's just be honest with with a big platform. And and he's not he's not interrogating what Dore is saying as much because Jimmy Dore is gonna do that thing where he kisses the ring and he moves out the way and he lets Hedges take that very interesting deeper dive into the surface level of what he's saying and then give you a real critique of power, yeah. empire, and the problems of capital. Dore does none of that and makes it about colored broads. <laughs> A colored broad <laughs> that he doesn't like because he has what Conan coined a few years ago on tour a hate boner <laughs> for AOC because he sees all that ass. Yep. And he is mad that she gives no fucks about anything he's got to say. That's a joke. I don't know if that's really why he's mad at her, but he does have a weird hate. For that. But that, that that explains the you know the fi- the fixation for sure, and, and certainly part of the puzzle. And I think it, it's important to note too. One thing I want to mention, by the way, thanks for. I, and sometimes I'll say stuff, and I'll be like, "Oh yeah, that's pretty good," and that that's what I'm like, "Yeah, hate boner, that's pretty that's good." Because that like uh, like what's Ben Garrison? Is that is that that fellow's name? The the fellow with, makes all like political cartoons. It's like they're, mm-hmm. weird, they're weirdly thirsty, like all of them. Like and, and it's just like what man. <laughs> Because they don't say that shit. You could easily put Jayapal, who has more experience, and yeah. actually a higher-ranking member of Congress, yeah. <laughs> as the person that you're mad at. Right. But you'd rather be mad at the one that's got a bigger internet platform? Yeah. Than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And, and, and that's, in you know, I feel like... <laughs> like, these same fools that are like, I don't see color. It's like they 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 like don't want to acknowledge that aspect of it, right? When some like when someone says they're telegenic too, like a lot of times that means all right, they're attractive. <laughs> you know, real talk and whatever. Like the fact, I think it's bizarre that that's just not acknowledged at all because just because it sounds it sounds bad when when you think about yeah. it. But when you talk about, I, I do want to address one point that. Pascal made in in, in uh, reference to him, me invoking <laughs> inv- invoking Jimmy Dore, and I've said it a second time. So if I say it a third time, I'm sure he pops up like beat. <laughs> Jack off. <laughs> <laughs> but that dude, like saying like I have like I have what I feel are very valid critiques of that guy, and which is to say that he's trying to uh, present himself as like the like the progressive equivalent of like Alex Jones or uh, uh, what's I agree. Um, Howard, I think he's trying to be progressive Howard Stern. Yeah, right. That's that's the attempt, and in the same way, I, or, uh, that. I so, think that's, that's a critique. I think it's a fair critique. Well, but but hold on. What what I wanted to get at is that by me bagging on Jimmy Dore rightly because he's a jackass a lot of the times, is that it doesn't mean that that I don't think that we should critique our elected leaders. In fact, I think we should. I just think his critiques are BS, and I think his critiques are they're not they're not based in anything that's going to advance power in any way. Let's explain why. 
So he's talking about, uh, you know, force the vote, right? Jimmy Dore has no idea what goes on in Congress. He has no idea nope. what she's getting out of it. He's assuming like the worst case scenario. Here's the problem I have with when WikiLeaks dropped all of the ambassadors uh, information, all the ambassadors emails. This is one of the big things that like, brought them to power, right? Everyone's like, oh, well, all information should be free. Yeah, should it? Because that's not how ambassadors work. I think you think how you know ambassadors work, but they don't. And you're only seeing part of the puzzle with that. Why do I invoke WikiLeaks with it? Because there is this entitlement complex that's, that showed up with that, that everyone's, oh, I know I, I'm going to galaxy brain, you know, uh, Monday morning quarterback, all of this stuff that these elected representatives are doing, thinking I have the whole picture. I guarantee you, you don't. I'm not saying it looks like House of Cards or anything, but I'm guaranteeing you don't. And I think it's just, it's disingenuous that trust but verify. Right. Like you don't want to put blind fealty in anything. Like Bernie Sanders isn't, uh, you know, there's probably no one closer to my personal worldview in politics that I can think of it uh, than Bernie Sanders. There's still stuff I don't agree with him on. Yeah. And that's okay. But it, I don't have blind fealty to any of that. You should be questioned, but don't assume you know everything. Like this idea of like even us guys talking. Right. You know, we're all coming from a very informed place. Everyone has their areas of expertise. Everyone has their opinions, their analysis. We don't know everything. How would we know everything? We don't even know what's going on like behind the curtain. Like, you know, for all very, we know, very good point. You know what, what I mean? There is the reality of hubris amongst left criticizers yeah. of power. That's a re- that's true. That's a very legitimate criticism. There's a kind of sense that we get from a bunch of commentators who haven't run in and out of their own room, no less run a government, that they (laughs) are the correct analyzers of why X, Y, Z is happening, not happening, or shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And, And assuming that they are the bearers of truth and that should not be questioned, and we should listen to them. And to your ultimate point, Conan, how does that, and I'm not saying I agree with this statement, but it's a fair question to ask. What makes them different from Rush Limbaugh in 1992 or what, what evolved and went down the... Now, I believe, right, you know, I, was, I, I observe right-wing content, left-wing content, you know, different types. Uh, I'm not a fan of right wing content because it's easier to find people that will platform it. It's, you know, there's money that pushes it. You have it's more, it's more lucrative. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's more <laughs> lucrative. You have you know libertarian sites. You have all kinds of. Um, I find that a lot of the kind of left progressive stuff is a little soft to me. So soft to mean that they're basically kind of they're liberals who are cosplaying radical, you know. Uh, yeah, that's find, real tough. You know, I find some of the harder, more left stuff can be very good, very informative. It also can be kind of informed by an ultra leftism that doesn't give you a real political solution. To how to do anything except revolution? Can I can I say can I say something? So yesterday, yesterday, to to what you're saying, Pascal and Conan. So yesterday, someone, uh, the what's the woman from the Majority Report? Uh, Jamie said Jamie, something. Yeah, Jamie Elizabeth. Yeah, Jamie Elizabeth said something on Twitter about uh, which I, I'm so mad I said responded anything. She goes, I don't like these want to be Marxist analysis of the people that stormed the Capitol. And I just asked a simple question. It's like, do you not like that people think they're all rich or that they're all kind of inbred poor rednecks? And all these people started responding to me. And I'm just asking a question. I'm not asking it like, <laughs> I'm literally asking like, well, what is your problem with this? And so the response started to be that everybody was more well off because of these certain factors so a friend of mine who i hope is watching this said well the guy that had his feet up on nancy pelosi's desk got a ppp loan well that loan was only for nine thousand dollars that's not that much money depending on what your business is and how much your operating costs are 
I know people that got PPP loans. They are not doing what they were doing before the pandemic because they only got a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars. That's not that much fucking money. So I don't know what dude's business was and nine thousand dollars for most people. I know even if you're fucking trying to start a band, you're not going <laughs> to last that long on nine grand for a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then another talk was, well, another lady took a private jet and I was like, oh, OK, I didn't know that. And so someone pointed, they put the article up. There was a New York Daily News article about this woman on a private jet, but she had chartered a private jet. I am not rich. I literally have $5.37 in my bank account right now. I am the epitome of not rich. This is what not rich looks like. I've taken a private jet on several occasions because it's cheap as fuck right now because who the fuck owns a private jet? Yeah. Not many people. So... There's companies like Jet Suite X where you can charter a private jet, private jet. You don't go into the regular airport. You don't got to take your shoes off. There's a little Starbucks machine in the fucking place that gives yeah. you coffee. It's dope. And you know what? It was cheaper than Southwest. So, so that's fascinating. Uh, the, the last, tour, the, uh, technically second to last tour that I went on in 2020 before mm -hmm. uh, COVID hit because we got two days into the second one before we had to cancel everything oh. uh the one where we went down to texas for the no coast fest in 2020 erica from uh the band the excellent band are we cursing on this yeah hell yeah yeah well because her band name is motherfucker right? motherfucker like, yeah. I, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, shout out to erica <laughs> yeah yeah she uh in into the tour she flew back to atlanta and rather than like come all the way back with us up to uh, milwaukee she just mm -hmm. flew back out of uh, I think it was Dallas, right? Which mm -hmm. was whatever what the last show was. And in as you say, the private jet in that situation was con considerably cheaper than just like a regular flight on like American Airlines or like who, who the hell even like you know goes to Atlanta. So using like private jet is like that's shorthand for ah rich dude people. You know, it's it's like yeah. they're doing they're doing they're in rich people stuff. And it's like yeah, that's not exactly true. And it's disingenuous. And and I think that comes back to the the bubble that is now the sort of like i'll call it the dsa style bubble Ooh. <laughs> right call that, it i call it say it again i i have a dsa member but go for it yeah yeah i i actually dig dsa as an organization but if if we can't just assume that we you, you know, like let's just say, like the, the progressive left, uh, that we're immune from bubbles. We are not immune from bubbles, and, and we need to think about the fact if we want to, would we rather be correct, or to rather get things done and advance our goals? And, yeah. and I, th I think there's a bunch of people that would just rather be correct, frankly, because it, yeah. it's more immediately gratifying. And, and I do believe we can have better things. I do believe that. And I am always like, man, I have major problems with the Green Party. Like, like the fact, like, what's the foreign policy? Don't wage war? Okay, now what? We're in a war. <laughs> Got nothing? Like Jill Stein, when she was put on both her and Gary Johnson, that, that fool, they got higher levels of public security in 2016 than like any can any uh, third party candidate in history. Neither yep. one of them held up to close scrutiny. You know why? They didn't have to. They didn't have to. You just like spout your talking points, donate here, away you go. And, and and again, we we've, we've spent a lot of times light, lighting up, you know, the Democrats, lighting up the Republicans. No, no one doesn't get doesn't get the fire because the reason why is that they're they're running different kinds of of, of game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Again, some people would rather be correct than get anything done. I love Jamie Peck. I think I think Jamie is is rad as hell. Then again, of course I do. You know, she's a beautiful goth girl who's like into politics. All right. Well, you know, <laughs> what am I going to say? I got to type, I guess. But but I think she's cool as hell. I think sometimes she falls into that would rather be correct than get things done world. A a and I don't say that lightly. I think she's sharp and incisive. And I think she asks all the right questions. But I don't think I necessarily agree with her on all the solutions. But I would have the problem she she these people want to be correct about things that are ultimately just opinions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Great. Here's your trophy. Here's your opinion trophy. Welcome. And so here's what and here's what kind of frustrates me about the whole conversation. 
we're sitting here having a conversation about who defines what a working class person is, right? right? It's almost like who defines what is worthy of being part of your movement or whatever the fuck. And I'm sitting here going, look, you can say this lady's rich. The article says she's a realtor in like Texas, I believe somewhere. And, and then I was like, well, she's a realtor. I don't know if she sells commercial or residential yeah, that, property. What does that mean? Yeah, exactly. You know, probably residential property. I don't know if she sells a house a month or if it supplements some sort of side income. Like, I don't think people understand. I live in California. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, one of the most expensive places to live in the world. And I know realtors that don't make that much money. Yeah. It's not like just because you sell a house, you're rich. Well, totally. Because the idea that like vocation uh, determines caste. Is it caste or caste? Cast. Yeah, cast. Is it okay? Because I always Tomato. said I always said <laughs> I always said caste system, and then like somebody said case, and then I'm like, which one's right? I don't know. I, I do the like read too much and you know, <laughs> didn't have anyone to discuss this stuff with for years. But like I I, I think vocation doesn't determine uh level of, of social order within a capitalist society and, and, it, and it's disingenuous to say so and, and i think it's something that really needs to be addressed in the same way that identitarian politics doesn't it purposely doesn't address class and it doesn't address class purposely because you can't be fueling uh corporate interests and also be addressing class you can it, it's it's not possible they're 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 at loggerheads but by the same token of course you want to get the black people involved. You want to get black people to vote for you. So you just <laughs> so you just take the class out. It also obscures the fact that there are class interests that exist amongst racial or ethnic categories that exist inside American society. Like you have to acknowledge it. Yeah. Who have corporate yeah. interests that yeah. work to the disadvantage of the majority of black America. Well, that that clip we played a clip uh, for our Thursday show from a from a 1994 very short lived show on show or HBO called Cosmic Slop, which was billed as like a black uh, Twilight Zone with, with George Clinton hosting. And Get the first, yeah, Shut yeah, the no one door. watched wow. it. It only aired twice. No one watched it. Uh, <laughs> I'd watch it. That sounds I, awesome. I fucking, <laughs> it came on when Mr. Show came on, so I was up when it came on, and I was like, this is the coolest thing ever, so I sent it to Pascal, and I used it as an as a opening for our Thursday show, and the first little vignette it is, is aliens come down and, and talk to the government, the U.S. government, and say, we will give you riches, you'll have abundance for years, we'll clean your polluted environment, we ask for one thing, and that's all of your black people. Whoa. And what happens? There's a class of black people, a very select rich class, where the president goes, Look, I'll let a hundred of you ends uh, go to Europe. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we'll sneak a hundred out. Wow. And and you know, it, there was definitely like they wanted a certain skin tone. It's it's a great episode. I advise everybody to watch it's called Cosmic Slop. You can get it on YouTube. Maybe they can get uh, Jordan Peele to redo it or something, like someone with a little more uh, swagger. It felt this. like it felt like something that he probably watched. Yeah, that's I wild. See him, I could see him watching that. The guy that did was behind it is Reginald Hudlin. So if you're familiar with the House Party films, oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, did it. It Robert Guillaume was in it. They had actually some really dang heavy great hitters. actors. In yeah, this yeah. Um, but. Uh, the, the class conversation we talk about, like a black politic, is never one that's had in the mainstream, even on left media. It's always yes, the black vote. Well, exactly as if as if it's as if it's a uniform thing, right? Which is it, it drives me crazy and having to deal with so many knuckleheads that, that were like, "Oh, well, Bernie Sanders has a problem with black people." I'm like, oh, you just just saying something doesn't make it true. I have you a know with black people. Yeah. <laughs> Because what, what is black people? Like, because it's real. It'd be real easy for, for me to be like, you know, yo, I got a problem with white people. Look at all these fools, like, you know, insurrecting oh, right now. Insurrecting is that? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, uh, that's the, white culture, right? But it's not. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, it is, but it isn't. Like, I don't want to be associated with any of that. No one, I don't want to be associated with anything like that. But again, it, it, it's wildly reductive, and, and and the idea that like you know, you know, quote unquote, white culture is hegemonically. Uh, the dispatch of that kind of ideology is done intentionally to right. obfuscate from the internal class contradiction that exists 
in black society that facilitate complete and total uh, connection to one political party to the right. detriment of most black folk well, to, with a complete lack of critical thinking because of that cultural domination. Yes. And, and, and the idea that like, well, where else are you going to go? <laughs> where else are you going to go? Going to go over these guys? Like, you know, with the, with the tiki torches, them, that's, that's the ones. You go but to. so many do so many do. Well, because they don't feel like they have a choice and they're like, Hey man, F you. I'm yeah. the, and it's registering a protest, and some of them maybe they, maybe they fall for the like the the faux populist re- rhetoric, like the um, y- y- you know, Double like where time. yeah, where where they're they're <laughs> picking and choosing um, what can and can't uh, uh what what was the 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 Louisiana governor um years back like populist mm-hmm. guy? I mean, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> it's funny. Uh. I'm talking about uh, uh, oh, Huey he Long. Did. Huey Long. God, Jesus okay. Christ, what's wrong with me? So the idea that like, like, and, and, and the idea, and I can't. I listened to some show where they were talking about how populism was sort of intentionally rebranded to be nationalism, mm-hmm. uh, like meaning that, that like this use use a word like purposely misuse a word in so many ways, uh, so many times that when you have a larger audience, you can change the meaning of that word. What wow. does socialism? Well, wow. socialism means I hate Topa that all these fools don't like because it's that's how it's been used for years. And like <laughs> corporate Democrats are like, well, I'm not a socialist. I don't care about that. Yeah, I'm not going to fight against it. Like I whatever. Beat the socialist man. I beat the socialist. Yeah, it, exactly. And that's just the most recent example. But that's happening for like years and years. Whereas mm-hmm. really, like socialism. I mean, the New Deal. You know, like <laughs> like unemployment insurance is socialism. And and, and the, but the idea is that people aren't thinking about that. They're thinking about it in terms of like. The other, it's like people can be othered and are othered. Ideas can be othered as well. A- and when you have a two front war, which in this case you have, this sort of is like you know, uh, crypto fascist nativist. Well, the same GOS time, though, I think that for me, as someone who was a socialist who was on the left well before Bernie Sanders, sure, reducing socialism to Keynesianism. Is a problem, like not the same hear, thing. Yeah, yeah. When For I sure. hear people who are Sanders acolytes, DSA type, say, yeah, the New Deal was socialist. No, the New Deal was proposed to neutralize. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was the and compromise. FDR said <laughs> the New I Deal was a compromise, saving capitalism. Yes, with the New Deal, it, it was the Elizabeth Warren mindset of the time. You know, I'm very leery of this notion of the, I mean, the New Deal is a public goods governance model that comes forth after communists and socialists literally force the ruling class to concession that makes them have to create public goods governance or state capitalism in response to exigent demands for more wealth transfer to the poor and working class. It is a reaction that utilizes ideas that were socialist, but Keynesian Keynesian New Dealism is not socialist. Completely agreed. And I would also a great agree point. that Keynesian New Dealism is more <laughs> radical than anything we've had in 50 years in American politics. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And, and I, th- I think it's amazing that. So so we talk about ratchet theory. You guys familiar with ratchet theory, right? Is that about shitty women? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> 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 Dang, you went there, huh? All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think ratchet theory got me all these damn kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, all right. So, so the the idea with with, with it's a ratchet effect, right? It's just so mm-hmm. that the, you're, you're this. There's a lot of applications of it. But the idea is that when when the discourse is moved to uh, what, one degree or the other. And we're going to say in this case, that the discourse is moved right. The discourse has moved more towards uh, corporatist, we'll, we'll call it New Deal, uh, neoliberal, however you want to call it. Um, 
the idea that as the discourse is moved right, the moderate uh, function shifts, meaning that like if, if you were to look at like and, and, and I think the idea of uh, a pure political spectrum that's just left and right is disingenuous but for pur purposes of this and specifically uh, addressing Pascal's point about the New Deal and how the New Deal was the compromise. The New Deal wasn't like the socialist thing. It, it was like, hey, we need to do this. The socialist is going to rise up. So as we've gone on in, in recent decades, there's been a push through uh, the DLC, Rahm Emanuel, uh, you know, Clintonism, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, continued through Obama. And Milton the, uh, Friedman. Milton Friedman. The Friedmanites. Exactly. That the entire discourse has moved to the right. So we get to the point where, oh, well, you know, uh, Elizabeth Warren, oh, she's just a hyper, hyper liberal, like whatever. It's like, she's actually like a regulation minded capitalist that's maybe a little left of the traditional political center. Like if you look at European nations versus us, we, our entire rhetoric has moved so far to the right as ratchet theory, because once it moves to the right, the middle now shifts because it's backed up by media institutions where the, 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 the quote unquote middle that everyone you know mythologizes and, and, and tries to put as some great grand high standard in the sky because of ratchet theory has moved more and more to serve corporate interests to serve capital in that way. And, and they're not even secretive about it. That's just how it's done. But the entire, even in my lifetime, the, the, we've, we've moved like several clicks over to the right that when people are talking about, oh, Bernie Sanders is like a Maoist revolutionary, not even a little bit. He's basically like a, you know, a, a New Deal Democrat, like, a, like an FDR or something, which again, as Pascal pointed out, that was the compromise. So, so, so and again, you can't look at things just on a strict left-right axis. But when we talk about ratchet theory, one of the problems I have, taking it all back home now, with this pro progressive, uh, you know, DSA-style bubble, is this idea that we can just be correct about a bunch of stuff, and that changes everything. That doesn't advance power. And this idea that, like, we have to divorce rhetoric from politics and from elections, I think it's very dangerous because in our current setup right now, how we have uh, our, our, our government, how we process things, we have to pay attention to elections. And that's why I think Justice Democrats is doing incredible work right now. That they're tar you know, targeting people like Henry Cuellar, you know, that didn't work out. Dan Lipinski, that did. Uh, and, and also targeting people that have that, again, bringing it back home to earlier, that we lost in 84 and got our, our asses kicked, Mondale effect. The, you know, the ghost of George McGovern, getting those people out of there. And people can frame that as a generational thing all they like. Cori Bush is a different type of politician than the person that came before her. And that right. is it, the, the advancement of good for the political process. Whether you're like, uh, you know, a Keynesian, <laughs> you know, whether you're like a Matt Stoller type, who I love, by the way, uh, whether you're a, uh, even, even Jimmy Dore, that advances power, whether he's an asshole about it or not. <laughs> <laughs> it advances power. But because of ratchet theory, we have to deal with the fact that the conversation is going to drift ever rightward until we pay attention to it. In the same way that socialism, again, was used as a hate topa for years for things that right wingers didn't like. And it was allowed to be that way because language matters. Read George Lakoff. Language matters. Framing matters. We live in a frame based reality now. And the right wing. You know, QAnon is the perfect example of that. That is frames personified. Trumpism is, is an example of that. Frames personified. Again, we have to be real careful about falling into the, the, the you know, what, what is it? The, the De Niro movie um, with uh, Ben Stiller, where he talks about like the circle of trust. What, you know what I'm talking about? Circle of trust. Meet the parents. Meet the parents. Thank you. We, we got to watch out. We don't fall into that meet the parents philosophy of like, you're not in the circle of trust. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that was a very good movie. I mean, it was kind of like whatever, kind of goof ass. But I was like, oh man, he's talking about he's talking about frames. Like if you stop and think about it. Did you know that Terry Polo, who plays the girlfriend slash wife in that movie, was hired because Gwyneth Paltrow, who is the real daughter of Blythe Danner, declined to be in the film. I did not. I didn't know any of that. Wow. This this is again we're we're, we're ruling it on trivia today. There you go. Uh, and so then tying all that back to <laughs> the, the original conceit of, of your essay, your Kill the Poor essay, mm -hmm. Jason, um, me with my limited platform on, on Twitter, which is largely 
you know, <laughs> m- m- yeah, it's largely music, right? Like every once in a while, like I'll, I'll engage with people on politics and stuff and they can, that can actually affect some good, but I am not in the circle of trust of the progressive media. Why would I be? Yeah. You know, like other than like being on your show now and again, and other than like direct action work of like, you know, being in the streets and then volunteering things along those lines, I'm not a part of the progressive media infrastructure. So because of that, when and Conan like, does direct action work, I do. And I don't, I'm not always, you know, I don't always post it to social media because I doubt the efficacy of that, which goes back to the Facebook argument. But finishing the point that I was saying right now, when you're banning from Facebook for that essay happened, one of the things I did is I went on Twitter and I started trying to tag people. So I tagged like, uh, you know, Jamie Peck, who I, who I mentioned, who I, who I like, Emma Vigeland, former of the Young Turks and the Majority mm-hmm. Report, um, David Dayan, who I worked with on political stuff like years and years ago before he was David Dayan, who's... Uh, who's <laughs> he's awesome i love david uh even former guest of your show ben burgess but who the mm-hmm. hell am i nobody mm-hmm. i'm outside that circle of trust mm-hmm. so because i'm outside that circle of trust i'm bringing something forward of like hey this is kind of a big deal like as much as i'm going to have this conversation with you guys this should be on one of like uh you know like one of, one of the big ones this should be on like chapo trap house or whatever like I'm just yeah dro- dropping dropping names of like uh you know you know the uh the Foo Fighters of uh, progressive <laughs> podcasting, right? I I think I was kind of shocked that more people didn't. I mean, Ben Burgess, I didn't hit him up because I had to refriend everybody, right? I had to hit Doug Lane up, and he wouldn't he wouldn't friend me because he thought it was fake. He's like, "Well, we're friends already, and we have to communicate because we do this thing on Zero Books." Yeah. And uh, he he was like, "Oh." The, what <laughs> his first reaction was like what they banned you for what and uh and i was talking to jean bajla and i was sending him the essay he's like they banned you for this i was yeah. like dude they didn't just ban me they deleted me and i think that's another thing i have to tell people people go oh well i was in facebook it's like this ain't no facebook jail this is they deleted yeah, they, they, my profile they find a solution to you <laughs> <laughs> it's like that Black Mirror episode where uh, where, where where John is his name John Ham is that his name the actor oh yeah 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 where, yeah, yeah, where yeah. his where his wife hits the hits the button and he becomes invisible to people that matter to him right. and that's kind of what happens when you get deleted from social media you become invisible to to people that that matter to you and, uh, and we and we like it when it's Glenn Beck or Donald Trump right we like it yeah. good fuck them. <laughs> but like here's the deal if we're just allowing that to be like an arbitrary decision when the winds of opinion change what does that mean well it means that like uh the the, the fellow you mentioned the uh social socialist world whatever it was the I, socialist I, world website yeah 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 which, which i you know like it's a little thing it's like eh, like about 40 percent of this like 20 percent of it's like crankcase stuff and 20 percent of it's information okay well fine but <laughs> but like can't you can't change the fact that like they got in in search results, as you mentioned earlier, again as, as a mm-hmm. callback, you look up the word socialism, they don't show up, and it's like it's in the name. It'd be like if you tried to look up Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends, and only Conan O'Brien results came up, and it'd be like, what? I put in the name, fool. <laughs> it, and, it's you know, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say. So, so, so to it just to, to follow up on that point, it's it, it's it's real easy to be like. Yeah, get him, get him, Butch, get him. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, when, when it's someone like Glenn Beck or when it's Donald Trump, they deserve it. But if they have that sort of, uh, you know, almost not even executive power, but uh, like royal power to just selectively enforce things, it's a valid critique to say, at what point do they come a public square? At what point do we, re- do, is that regulated? Who should be regulating that? And let's also talk about the fact that, like, with as old as our elected representatives are, most of these fools barely understand the internet, but they understand what Facebook is because it's their landing page, as we talked about earlier. So, do we go for the hard regulation? Because if we're going to do it, now's the time to do it. Where all these these assholes are are all worked up because they feel like you know they're personally attacked. These cry bullies, right? Uh, and if we're going to do it, do it now. In the same way that we should do electoral reform right now. Don't get me started on black box voting, but like they're focused on all the wrong thing right now. But the fact is central tabulation servers with like open back in passwords that like have never been changed is a threat to our democracy. They're talking about some crazy stuff over there. 
<laughs> but yeah. that said, it needs to be addressed. So do it now. Just the duffel bags. <laughs> do it now. Like, never let a crisis go to waste. Like, we don't have to just sit here and take it. We don't have to sit here and be like, well, it sucks that that's happening. Let's let's analyze it from a, you know, a freaking socialist perspective. Okay, fine. But we can also take action. You know what I mean? And and like we we need to we need to understand that coalition building doesn't mean the West Wing. Coalition building also doesn't mean that like you buy into what someone else is, is doing, like what their ethos is. Someone can be useful to you as a coalition, and then after you're like, hey, fuck you, fuck you. And then you go in your merry way. But we don't do that. We don't do that because again, again, and I'm using the quote we, we would rather we would rather be correct than get things done. That, that, that's kind of what I'm Sure. Who is who is the we you're talking about here though? So I'm talking about what I assume is mostly the audience for, for this show. Like the, the progressive left in this situation, uh, people that are not uh, institutionalist, establishment-minded, people that understand that uh, Republican Party and Democratic Party are serving corporate end goals, and that is the feature, not the bug. Now, now people have different prescriptions and solutions for that. I, I might have a different solution than you do. I don't know. But I am saying that like, if we have agreed upon set of facts, which is half the problem, right? If we agree with <laughs> we agree with the crazies, the, the if we agree with these QAnon crazies that like, hey, maybe Facebook and Twitter should be considered a public square, what does that mean next? Well, they're gonna ask for their speech to be protected and like try to have some weasel language where they can like crack down on the progressive and liberals. So we're talking about solutions now. I'm talking about actual coalition building. Not what Biden thinks is going to happen, which is like a bunch of Republicans are getting on board with a stimulus package. That ain't going to happen. That's West Wing shit. It's not going to happen. But the we in this case can mean a lot of things, but we, we, need, we need to get out of our bubbles in a way that affects power. So, and if they're not public spaces, which somebody, uh, uh, Kerry Robinson in, in the chat box said they're not public spaces. Okay, fine. So then they're private entities. With terms and services so are we, what are we talking about like mm -hmm. again we need there needs to be definitionally letting this be a uh letting this this go in this gray area where no one quite understands what the hell's going on mm -hmm. that don't fly man well all that being said we're coming up on two hours and i have to make breakfast for a very <laughs> attractive woman <laughs> and uh make food for a very hyper beige child pascal do you want to you have any parting remarks i mean my position listen i really am i i i really appreciated um conan being here because there's a lot that he said that i agree with somewhat kind of disagree with his discussion of ratchet theory and the importance of framing I do agree with the um, for, uh, of um, with the importance of framing. I also agree with maintaining the principles of your political position, and that just because we come in into this after a fifty year period of counter revolution, doesn't mean that we have to be afraid to talk about actual socialism because Donald Trump is going to turn us into a bunch of you know. Cole's playing Bolsheviks and the right is going to you know, frame us in a certain way because that being said, you know, Sanders framed himself as a socialist. He, he, he didn't run away from that label label. And, uh, you know, he, he could have run away from it at some point or explained it away. He did not. The DSA called themselves the democratic socialists of America as progressivists as they might be. So, I understand the the nature of framing and the reality of the Overton window shift, shifting right or left and the need to make your political framing in a way that is as uh, expansive to people being interested in it. I'm also interested in having a, polit a political understanding of what you're fighting for. What does it mean to challenge capitalism, imperialism? racism and sexism what does that mean you know like, does being you know rose twitter mean that you really challenge the united states having 800 military bases around the world while having the military contracts to build factories in your neighborhood 
be something that you say, no, we shouldn't do that. Or voting against military budgets. Is that a priority that's a priority for you? Or what does it mean to be an anti-capitalist and, and, and an anti-imperialist and an anti-racist and an anti-sexist? You know, for me, clarifying those points have a priority to simply just worrying about the framing being made up, uh, uh, up appealing certain categories of people. But I don't want you to think, Conan, that I'm disregarding your concern. I'm not saying it's not a valid concern. What I'm saying is that I'm seeing it being used by the same faction of the left that I think we both demonstrated we have problems with as a means of them maintaining rather 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 bland po- bland politics from a left perspective. You know, I got my political education writing for almost a decade for Black Agenda Report under Bruce Dixon. There were certain things that weren't a question for me in an environment of learning about, you know, why imperialism is problematic, why separating racism from capitalism is ridiculous, why it's important as a man to challenge sexism and deal with my own internal contradictions of of why I don't pl- place women's voices in the, in the position that they need to be, you know? Why having you know homophobic opinions about people who are gay is stupid, you know? And having that confrontation within myself come from a brother who was a former member of the Chicago Black Panther Party and had trans, trans you know, transcended all of those confrontations in himself was a very important experience in my life. And what I'm saying is that I don't think it would require people who come from that black political experience of being on the black left to have to surrender what I'm saying their principles just for the sake of quote unquote worrying about framing. You see, you follow what I'm saying, Conan? I, think I, 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 I don't. You lost him. I, I totally do. I totally do. And I and I, I think that this is a like a much larger conversation. That uh, and by the way, I just want to mention that um, I'm now. Uh, you know, I was ranting about the the white dude with the truck, like you know, ranting into his phone. I ran out of my battery, so that's literally what I'm doing right now. Uh, but but I think you're on. Uh, I think you're on some important stuff, and I think that that's a larger conversation that we're probably not going to have right now. No, because like I said, I have to make. Uh... I have to make uh, breakfast. And, and, and first of all, so so let me just say, uh, if I may, and Pascal, I don't, I don't want to uh, to impede upon you, but again, dealing with some some battery battery issues, uh, I think that first of all, this has been great. And anytime you guys want me to have on, have me on, uh, I'm happy to talk about this, ranting into a uh, camera or not. And I, I think there's a couple things that I, that I just like to everyone to come away with from from my world, which is if we're, we're talking about social media, which is how this, this all started, and yeah. the s- imperial decisions that social media can make regarding huge parts of our life, we have to decide if it's a private enterprise or a public square, and if it's going to be regulated, and if, is it going to be regulated or not? And the t- and are we going to build a coalition to address that? Can you know, can we temporarily team up with people we dislike to accomplish that with a shared goal? I don't know. I don't know the answers to those questions, but th- those are the questions. Because I would rather, because again, a lot of people, they'd rather be correct than get anything done. And I think we can have better things, and I think it absolutely has to be addressed. And I think we're at a, we're at a breaking point with it, that if we don't address it, we're in a rough spot. Well, that's that's a very and I don't have a fast and loose answer to that question. I think that's the question that needs to be asked going forward. Are you serious about this? If you're serious, then we have to debate whether this is a public utility or is this going to stay a private thoroughfare? Period. Right. Yep. If you're not willing to have that conversation, you know, put your gun down and walk your guns down and walk home because your that's not down. that's not the adult thing in the room right now. Go put your internet guns down and walk away. <laughs> your internet. <laughs> put down the internet and walk away. Twitter, because I don't, so many, oh, God. So, it's Saturday. 
uh, when I was a kid, and I, I don't know if it was the same way for you, Conan, and I can't speak for you, Pascal, but I'm sure there was a moment where you had hair like me. When yeah. I got dropped off at the hood ass barbershop in Richmond, California, it was definitely uh, whose phone's ringing? I don't know. I think someone's trying to call me. <laughs> call her on the air. <laughs> but what I was going to say was uh, on Saturday, it's always the busy day at the barbershop. And this is where these kind of conversations in my world were had at the barbershop on 23rd Street in Richmond, California. And uh, that's what this is kind of like for me. It's it's a moment where we're sitting around waiting to get cut, and the good which I sh- need, man. I got mad COVID here. Right you do. Now. You this, you, this you, look, you did look like a crazy man. And Conan <laughs> actually is all when he does perform, he's all fitted and got a sparkly suit on and all the, the tie, the whole nine. Yeah, I'm raggedy that, right now. <laughs> that being said, there was always some good times that were had afterwards. So I found the clip. I did play this clip. If you watch the Thursday stream, I played it. But I know because Conan's here, there's some people that have never seen this show before, and that's fine. So I'm going to play it again because I think this show is is very entertaining. And this is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And this show came out in 1994. And so aliens have landed, and they are asking the vice president of the United States for all of the black people And the aliens figure that the only way for the American power system to understand them is if they turn into Ronald Reagan and talk. Which is... (laughs) Damn. (laughs) That's real. (laughs) So enjoy this clip. Everyone have a very nice weekend. It's going to be very nice. Greatest weekend ever. Thanks so much, guys. All right, brother. So don't don't hang up just yet, Coney. You got to see this. Three months ago, speculation has run rampant as to their appearance, the size and shape of their craft. Oh my god! Literally, a flotilla of spacecraft have just materialized solar right over our heads. This is absolutely amazing. And this is literally an unbelievable sight. You know, as I look to my left, I see Vice President D'Amato and Secretary of State Buchanan approaching the microphone. <laughs> For those of you who are concerned, President Taylor, of course, is safe and secure in an undisclosed bunker until it's determined whether or not these aliens pose any threat. Hello. Hello. Is this on? Can you understand me? I'm the vice president of... We are space traders bearing exquisite gifts that will restore your nation to its former glory. Nearly limitless quantities of gold and precious metals that will instantly erase your deficit. Machines that will renew your rivers and your air. Cold fusion technology for a safe, cheap, and inexhaustible source of energy. All we ask in return is the delivery to our vessels. Five days from now, Every child, woman, and man in your nation with at least 2,500 milligrams of melanin in their skin per square centimeter. What the hell is melanin? Put more simply, in trade for solving all your most pressing domestic catastrophes, we are asking for every person in your country that you would classify as black. Uh Are you kidding? (laughs) No, we are not. (laughs) What are you going to do with them? Well, that does not concern you. We give you five days to decide, and the offer is non-negotiable. We will not try to coerce you in any way. Yet, I hope we can do some business together. Damn. We wait all this time for a fucking UFO and they come here with this? <laughs> <laughs> it's all bullshit, right? right? Maybe. Maybe this day is going to go down in history. An end to poverty. End to pollution. Cheap, unlimited energy for every American. Sounds like a hell of a re-election platform. Sam. 
I have to go on record as saying this is crazy. But. But what? Well, welfare rolls would be cut 40%. Food stamps, Medicare, drug abuse programs slashed. May I add something, Mr. President? You know, if I could guarantee the prosperity of this great country by giving life or taking off of those space traders, I'd do so without a moment's hesitation. You know, the Secretary's courage is not unlike that American men and women have exhibited when called to military service. And well, some go more willingly than others, but almost all go with the knowledge that they might never come back. Now, I don't believe what I'm hearing. Doesn't anybody see a downside to this? You know, Casper's absolutely right. The guilt that many whites would feel for sending the blacks away could take a severe psychological toll, with medical costs possibly reaching astronomical levels. This is madness. Our military services would be decimated, depleted of 30% of our manpower. But with unlimited energy, think of the weapons you could create. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, Sam, you were elected by the slimmest of margins. Your African-American vote was key. I don't expect them to be thrilled, but uh, how can I put this delicately? Their future electoral clout is going to be severely limited. Ooh. <laughs> and Casper, let's be honest. Do you really think the aliens will treat them worse than we have? No, the real issue here is spin control. The decision has to be the will of the people and not the administration policy. How about a national referendum? Have MCI fire up a couple of those yes and no 900 numbers. I'll be damned. We're on to something here. <laughs> Uh, Professor Golightly, you look like you want to say something. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. Uh, as you know, Mr. President, I have been a lifelong card-carrying Republican. I feel I was instrumental in your moderate wing wrestling control of the party from religious extremists. I have often supported this administration's repeal of affirmative action legislation, not protested its decreasing handouts to the poor. And in helping you undermine these policies, I realized that your reasons for doing so differed from mine. And yet I was always a good soldier for the party. I sincerely believed, and still believe, that black people need to learn how to stand on their own two feet without the crutches of governmental legislation. <laughs> but I'm afraid I must protest in the strongest terms possible what I've heard in this room today. What is being proposed cannot be passed off euphemistically as selective service. At its best, it is group Banishment. At its worst, it is utter and complete extermination. Oh, Professor, that's wait, wait, ridiculous. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, did I miss something? Who said anything about exterminate? Well, the space traders seem perfectly nice and civil. <laughs> Their planet might be one great wow. big club med for all we know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sam, we do not even know if these creatures can deliver on their end. You and I play poker together. What if they're as good at bluffing as you are? Now you're whistling Dixie. It's, whoa! <laughs> I still think the U.S. would say yes. Oh, I, 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 I was about to say, what's up, Joe Biden, on that last one? <laughs> <laughs> and so so uh, they actually asked the aliens to to do something to explain that they actually can do these things. And they turn the Statue of Liberty into solid gold. And uh, by doing that, it becomes worth like $15 trillion, enough to uh, pay off the national debt and have every single American not have to pay taxes for, for so many years. 
Um, and and so uh, like the like the guy playing a, a Bill Clinton esque president says uh, they fire up two nine hundred numbers. But was really interesting, uh, a yes and no number for people to call. What was really interesting in that was uh, they used polling data. Mm. Mm. So there's a conversation, and I'll be very quick about this. I think I hear the pitter patter of of feet. Uh, they they go well. Polling data says that the majority of white people are against this. And then Robert Guillon goes, "Yeah, but that's polling data. People can vote in the privacy of their own home. Mm. They're being asked." question in public you're going to give a very different answer because no one has to go back and see what you actually said conan who did you vote for yeah uh, well, we have a vote for bernie pin on bernie sanders you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly so, which, which is that's the like the performative thing right versus what mm -hmm. people actually do like the fact that you know when they talk about this oh it's a silent majority of trump voters that's bs but there are a bunch of people that are like, well, actually, I think both the candidates suck. But man, fool, you are a Trump voter. Shut the fuck yeah. up. So that the, the whole show, again, it's on YouTube. It's it's pretty entertaining. Th this episode has some very interesting conversations among different classes of black people. And one of the, I wouldn't say funny parts is Robert Guillaume's character, Benson, uh, his character, uh, his, he has a light-skinned wife. That is too light to go. So her character is constantly tanning. Because <laughs> she doesn't want to have to leave her family. So every scene she had, she's trying to get to her. What a wild ass skit. That's this is uh yeah, this they should uh I mean it almost seems like the new Twilight Zone. Right, like you know how like some of the oh. stuff that uh, Peel was doing with the new Twilight Zone, which which I, I liked, even though I thought it was like a third totally badass. And like a third of it's like, yes, I agree with that viewpoint. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like a third of it's like, oh, that was fine. It, it, it I, I saw maybe three or four episodes of it. And from the ones I saw were, were pretty interesting. The first one I thought was really good with the comedian. Yeah, that was one of the best ones. That one was badass. That was really good. The cast was great. Everything was great. Uh, I would like to see him take a shot at doing this. But I think because he's got Twilight Zone, it's like, why do an even funkier one? Which is like we make the Twilight Zone funky. Here's George Clinton. <laughs> Twilight by the way, Zone, he's, but funky. <laughs> he's, he's Rod Serling in this. So yeah. every episode starts off with a floating it's George, George Clinton. Clinton. Really? God damn. All right. So this yeah, watch show. watch the show. Thank you guys once again for coming on. And we Chapman.